This episode is brought to you by Lightpoint, of which I'm the principal engineer. Lightpoint provides the collision reconstruction community with data and education to facilitate and elevate analyses. Our most popular product is our exemplar vehicle point clouds. If you've ever needed to track down an exemplar, you know it takes hours of searching for the perfect model, awkward conversations with dealers, and usually some cash to grease the wheels. Then back at the office, it takes a couple more hours to stitch and clean the data, and that eats up manpower and adds a lot to the bottom line of your invoice. Save yourself the headache so you can spend more time on what really matters, the analysis. Lightpoint has already measured most vehicles with a top-of-the-line scanner, like his RTC 360, so no one in the community has to do it again. The exemplar point cloud is delivered in PTS format, includes the interior, and is fully cleaned and ready to drop into your favorite programs, such as Cloud Compare, 3ds Max, Rhino, Virtual Crash, PC Crash, among others. Head over to lightpointdata.com slash datadriven to check out the database and receive 15% off your first order. That's lightpointdata.com slash datadriven. All right. My guest today is Dr. Jeffrey Mutart. Uh, Jeff Mutart began his career in crash investigation and reconstruction as an accident reconstructionist for the Groton, Connecticut Police Department in 1985. Uh, since then, he's earned a master's degree in experimental psychology from the University of Hartford and a PhD in industrial engineering and operations research from the University of Massachusetts. At both universities, his research interest was related to driver's response behaviors, which we'll get a lot into. For the past 30 years, he has compiled and conducted scientific research to determine what caused drivers to respond as they did. He has authored more than 70 technical book chapters and scientific studies on traffic safety topics and has been a sought after speaker, giving more than 200 lectures throughout the world. He has also earned several awards for his research and contributions to driver safety, and his opinions have been frequently sought by reputable sources, such as automobile manufacturers, government safety agencies, and standards committees. So thanks for taking the time out of your day. I'm sure you're slammed on a day-to-day -day basis to uh, spend some time with us. Good to talk to you. So I, th I thought we'd start kind of uh, at your beginning, which seems to have kind of predicted your current career a little bit. Uh, you and I, we've talked about this in the past. We're both data junkies. It's what makes us happy. It blows our hair back. But I'm not sure that my obsession for data manifested as so it, early so as yours. So it took you 30 seconds to do a hair joke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. I figured, yeah. Right. And there probably uh, will be more. Uh, <laughs> so I, I didn't really get obsessed with data until later on in my career. But from what I understand, it really took a hold of you early uh, to the point where your mother identified that you were a nerd when you were very young. <laughs> yeah, well, in, in my high school baseball teammates, uh, you know, I annoyed them as well because... They 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 would make fun of me the the fact that I'd know my batting average before I even got to first base or before I even got back to the dugout after yeah. a bat or I'd know how my ERA changed when a player got another hit off me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So were you documenting that somehow, or was that just all in your head? Yeah, in my head. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's you know, and and yes, I'd calculate. Even though we played seven inning games, I always calculated my ERA based on a nine inning game because that would lower. Yeah, it. that's what the pros are doing. <laughs> oh, okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, and it doesn't shock me that you can keep that information straight in your head. Uh, anybody who's ever taken one of your classes, it seems pretty clear that one of your super strengths is really memorizing the the research and. We've talked a little bit about that in the past, and I know you said your memory is not great for everything, but when it comes to the things that really matter to you and to your career, they just stick. You know what it is? It's it's a it's a it's a big story to me. Uh, how drivers behave when I when I teach when I describe it to me, I'm describing a story of what affects drivers and and likely what's going on in their minds. We don't know what's going on in their minds, but we can see how they're behaving and and how different things change that behavior. And it creates a story. And, uh, and it makes it easier when I read another study to add that study to my story. And so I think that's a little bit what helps 
it, it, I'm not I'm not memorizing studies. I'm taking studies and adding them to my story. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. And are you able? It seems to me that you are able to also memorize simultaneously the quantitative values. In other words, the average response time in this situation was 1.4 with a standard deviation of 0.5 or something. Well, it, <laughs> that comes from just repeating it over and over again. So, for example, uh, a couple new studies came out. A couple, As a matter of fact, we haven't even discussed this, but a couple motorcycle studies came out this past mm-hmm. year. And, and so I put it into my course materials, but then I have – we have the advanced class, but, and then we have the, you know, software class, and then we have the uh, introduction class, and then we have the book, and then we have the software. <laughs> and I keep repeating these numbers over and over again in my head and, and in, in our spreadsheets and, and in our data, and it makes it easier f- to remember. You know? Yeah. And yeah, I've, I've noticed that as well. Uh, I think that my skills and ability to recall studies have grown substantially since I started teaching them uh, to other colleagues. That's That's been a big help. Uh, well, and, so, that's, gr- and, and that's what I tell everybody that takes the class is, you know, the first time they take one of our classes is they, sometimes it can be daunting. And I say to them, just hang on, you know, it, it grows, it grows and, and once you have that one or two studies, and if you are a data junkie, it becomes six and ten. It becomes then it's, next thing you know, it's dozens in uh, yeah. over time. Yeah, and that, that that in my experience, that is one of the things that really elevates your ability to accurately reconstruct the crash, or in your case, uh, analyze human response is. Uh, familiarity with the research and the ability to call on the appropriate research when necessary. You know, it's like having the study that really hits the nail on the head makes such a big difference for analyzing a specific case. Well, you know, each, each crash gives us another, that's the other thing is now, you know, I was always the youngest one in the back of the classroom and some, sometime I ended up being one of the older guys in the front of the classroom <laughs> and I really don't know when that happened. And it just, it just did. It just seems like yesterday that I was the young guy in the back of the classroom. But, uh, you know, having, having years of experience at this field, they always say like, uh, professional athletes have an advantage if they started at a younger age. And I, I think there is some advantage to that, that uh, because I started so young in this field, uh, you know, I was the first fatal crash I was at was I was 23 years old and and uh, that was 1983. And <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. You, you and you got your from what I recall, you got your bachelor's in economics and then went straight to law enforcement. Yeah. Uh, and. You started the accident investigation unit or reconstruction unit at Groton PD. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, it, well, it even started before then at the police academy. Second day of the police academy. D- day one, I called my wife and, you know, it was the regular hazing of the new recruits. Yeah. And I went, oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, this might <laughs> and, not be for me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know. And day two, uh, first class, it was like seven o'clock in the morning, first class. It was crash reconstruction, crash investigation. And I called my wife that night and I said, I know what I want to do the rest of my life. That's amazing. It, it was, uh, you know, and, and then I just annoyed everybody at the Groton Town Police until they sent me to every training class that I could take. And I took classes on vacation. And uh, it was just, it it resonated with me. Yeah. And the combination of of the data and the mathematics, the analytics, do you you recall what it was exactly that drew you in so quickly? You know what? There were so many things. Number one, if... 
I, I, uh, I got a, a murder case right after getting out of the police academy. And I got a fatal crash right out of, I was one of those guys with the black cloud over me, right? So no murders in the town of Groton for 10 years. And, you know, I'm out of the police academy and three months on, I get a murder that I go to. And, but the murder, of course, gets ripped away from that uh, line officer, right? Mm. But I get a fatal crash to investigate about a week earlier than that. And it's mine to keep. And I was like, oh, I can Big responsibility, but also exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same, same thing. A a person died and, and, uh, uh, and and they're going to allow me to explore this case, to investigate the case. And so that was one thing that, was very enticing to me. The other thing is that it was so much data and so much math that that just, you know, like you were saying, my mother uh, noticed that, you know, and all the neighbors' mothers also would say, Jeff, can you just play without keeping statistics on everything? And, uh, you know, it just, but it's, oh, it's what I've always done. It's, I just love statistics. I just, whether it be sports or, or, uh, playing or, or calculating, uh, I, I just always loved because it gives you insight into behavior. And early on, like even when I was nine and 10 years old, I, I could see that having statistics gave you insight into behavior and, uh, and, and and that's really what I find so fascinating with the with the you know with driver behavior statistics is you can see what drives behavior in driver yeah. in driver response times in driver response choices. Yeah, I always found that really interesting too. And like you and I have discussed in the past, you're you're establishing that baseline with the stats in the research. And then in a particular case, if you are able to quantify the response time, if you have enough evidence to do that, then you can compare them to that baseline and make some sort of uh, observation or calculation, I guess, that helps everybody understand what happened. And there's even more now, like with with the advent of the eye tracking uh, equipment, where we can predict with pretty good certainty where an experienced driver is going to glance next. And we cannot predict with any certainty where the 16 year old driver is going to glance next. Right. Yeah, I I remember that taking your class and and there were people looking at planes uh, when they're entering an intersection. Yeah. It's, you know, a 16 year old's glance pattern is like a random number generator. It's, it's like, you know, uh, you just don't know. And it, it, it amazes me when still to this day, driver training manuals say drivers should scan. And the only drivers that scan are 16 year old drivers, you know, or, or drivers who, aren't paying attention (laughs) because if you're scanning, you're not predicting, you're not anticipating it. Drivers who are experienced and, and usually over age 25, by the time they've gotten to age 25, they are anticipating who is going to interfere with their driving next. And so their glance patterns reflect that. And, and (laughs) you can, you can see just by their glances, what they're thinking, you know, oh, they don't trust that guy, you know, oh, they don't trust it. Oh, look at where they're looking now. They don't like that. You know, you can see the pattern of glances. And when you see, oh, you know, drivers over and over and over again, will look to the same areas. You can see we do develop certain behaviors, certain anticipatory behaviors when we drive. And it, 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 it's 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 fun to see how similar we all are in in many ways as well. 
And can you bring those novice drivers closer to the 25-year-old or all the way to them? And if so, how quickly can you do that? In other words, could you work with the 16-year-old for a week and get them pretty close to a 25-year-old if they're heeding your advice? Here's the thing. Is you can't make a 16-year-old 25, you know, and but we can try to make them close. And if we give them... Uh, if we give them enough information, if we see what experienced drivers, what they do, where do they put their foot? You know, do they come off the throttle? When do they come off the throttle? When do they move in their lane? Where do they look at what point in time? And if we can look at the teen drivers or, or, or commercial drivers or whoever we're looking at and see where they're looking. And if we can fill in the gap where, you know, where are the experienced drivers looking who do not crash? And then where are the novice drivers looking who tend to have an average of one crash a year? And if we can teach that teen to be better at glancing as if they're a 25-year-old, their performance improves. Now, in the research we've done, we've, we've, We've had very good success in getting the novice drivers to to behave as an experienced driver has. But in real life, uh, I I, I would say uh, if we can get close, that would be a nice goal in real life. Yeah, because they don't have that same mental maturity. They don't have the experiences. They don't have the same judgment level. There's just a lot, like you're saying, you, you can help them mimic that search pattern and that's going to help, but you're not turning them into an experienced driver. Correct. And, but, you know, there's been good research, like the University of Massachusetts has worked on the RAPT, the risk and perception training. And uh, they, you know, they, pr- it, this is the only driver training that I'm aware of that has been validated and shown to actually be associated with reduced crash risk. Wow. And uh, in teen males, uh, which are the most susceptible to crashes. Yeah, I remember uh, being one, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, uh, that, you know, there was testing out in California, and it was found to – you know, drivers who received the placebo training had this typical crash risk. Those who had the wrapped training had a reduced crash risk. And that was some of the research I was doing at University of Massachusetts. Is I was working on the mitigation training, for, you know, sort of kind of the uh, tie in with the wrapped training. So wrapped was risk and perception training. So teaching drivers to glance better, more efficiently. And then my part of the training that I developed was, all right, after you anticipate the, ha- the hazard, where should your foot be? Should it still be on the throttle or should it be off the throttle? Should it be on the brake or should it be on the brake hard? And so we were looking into the risk mitigation uh, training. And what what really motivated me towards that kind of training program is that when I a, a bunch of friends on the police department had a charity event, uh, a scramble golf tournament. Now, as you can probably imagine, I don't get to golf too often. <laughs> and so I decided to get some, you know, I decided to go down to the driving range and get some training. And I just didn't want to suck. I just didn't want to be I've, really I've bad, been there. Yeah, you know? I've done that same thing. And I figure if, hey, if, you know, if they can use just a couple of my balls, I win, you know, yep. and in, in, in the, in the golf uh, tournament there. And so I go down there and he says, well, come back every Thursday night at eight o'clock uh, for, for eight weeks. And I'm like, wait, you're going to, you're going to spend 45 minutes with me on eight nights to hit a stationary ball. And and he's telling me where to put my feet, where to put my legs, where to put my elbow, where to hold my, you know, how to hold the club. And, and it occurred to me that 
we're not giving our novice teen drivers anything like this kind of training. And they're driving a 3,500 pound weapon. And, uh, and everything's moving around them. The ball is not stationary. Right. And so that's, that's, you know, my research in, 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 in the driver training, uh, realm was to identify specifically where do experienced drivers come off the throttle? Where do experienced drivers hit the brakes? When do experienced drivers hit the brakes hard? And, uh, and, and, you know, where, you know, where do they swerve? How do they swerve? Uh, and, and to teach the teen drivers, to teach younger drivers the proper way to break, the proper way to steer, you know, rather than having them learn by trial and error for the first, you know, nine years of their. <laughs> exactly. You know, and and just the consequences ha- are, yeah. are, are are so grave. I mean, that's one of the biggest killers. If not, I mean, you probably know better than I, I'm not a safety expert, but uh, between 16 and 24 year old, years old, I think it's one of the most common ways to pass, unfortunately. Well, graduated licensing has saved almost as many lives And some studies would suggest as many lives as the seatbelt. And uh, so it, it, you know, we can see we can make inroads with driver training and, and, and techniques for reducing crashes. So, you know, I know they have that vision zero uh, that someday we, you know, cars won't crash. That's a very high endeavor, high goal that I don't think we're going to get anytime soon, but yeah. it's a nice goal. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And my, you know, when I had my kids in 2013, I probably envisioned at that point that they would be driving along in a nearly fully autonomous vehicle that was unlikely to crash. Now that we're at 2023 and they're 10, so they're only six years away from driving themselves, I'm starting to become more and more terrified. And I bring home some of my casework and I don't show them gory photos or anything like that, but I tell them about what happened and the misjudgments that led to that crash occurring in the first place. So if this research from UMass Amherst could come out, I, I think every parent in the country would appreciate it. Uh, there, well, it's, it, it, it's, it's out right now. It's, it's available online. Uh, I know state of, I believe the state of Wisconsin is using that training. The state of California is using the training and, uh, oh, and great. some parts of Canada. Okay. And, uh, and it might be a few more as well that, it, that is using the risk and perception training. And, uh, so it's, it's, it's encouraging, uh, to see that there, there are improvements. There's a lot more, uh, driver training improvements that are need. For example, in the commercial vehicle area that, that's woefully outdated, uh, training published in 1952. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot more that needs to be done, but, uh, but it's, it's exciting to see that, uh, a lot of people are looking into, uh, better, better techniques for training drivers. Yeah. And I'll get uh, a little bit later on. I do want to talk about the fatality statistics and how those have, uh, really been worse and worse over the past couple of years. Um, but I want to go back a little bit just to your background because that shift that you made from law enforcement, from collision reconstruction to uh, torturing yourself with a master's and a PhD and seeking out the UMass uh, program is obviously not a common one, uh, very rare. And you also made the shift from collision reconstruction to human factors specifically and continued to narrow your focus. So was that a gradual process or did a, a, a switch flip at some point? What sent you back to, to academia? In 1993, you know, well, in, you know, I, like I said, I, I loved crash reconstruction. Uh, I, I, I think one of the reasons I, I left police work or the primary reason I left police work is to do it full time. And, uh, and, and then in 1993, the Supreme Court Daubert versus Merrill Dow pharmaceuticals 
ruling comes out. And it says that we, as experts, have to be able to report our error rate. We have to be able to explain what method we used, how we applied that method properly to the facts of our case, and we have to be able to report the error rate of our analysis. And I started going through my crash reconstruction and my measuring tools, they had, they, they give you the error rate right on the, right on the, man, you know, right on the, um, you know, owner's manual. Uh, and then, you know, you can do whether it be Monte Carlo analysis or, or, uh, finite difference analysis or, it's just standard deviations. You you can take care of error rate with your speed calculations. But the number that I didn't have an error rate to is the, you know, what we were taught was, you know, use 1.5 second perception response time. And that's right, right? That's what we should do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get back into that. Yeah. I didn't mean to derail uh, you. <laughs> um, and so clearly the crash reconstruction community didn't get the memo, you know, from the very first reaction time study conducted in 1868. We knew different stimulus leads to a different response, leads to a different response time. And, uh, you know, Going back to that 1.5, what, what event does that lead to? You know, what is that, what event is that for? When is the starting point of that? When is the ending point of that? And if you can't answer when it starts, when it ends, or what crash type it's for, then you should not be using it. And because you're just making stuff up. And, uh, so, and, you know, that became clear to me. That, you know, we didn't know the starting point. We didn't know the ending point. We didn't know what crash type it was for. And according to Delbert, we couldn't cite the error rate to that number. So if 1.5 was the average, what's the range of normal drivers? What's At what point does a driver become unreasonable? And, you know, at 1.6, at 1.7, at 1.8? And if you don't know the standard deviation, if you don't know the distribution of response times, you have no idea the value of a 1.6. Yeah, you know? you're flying and, blind. Uh, so that that became obsessive, you know, it, it like almost like like oh my god, I I got to get the answer to this before I get killed and um, and and embarrassed on the stand. And I just started collecting studies. Uh, like some people collect coins, I collected studies. And that was in 93. And, and I just uh, just kept collecting studies. And now we're way over a thousand perception response time studies that have been published. And, and, uh, and, and we just keep collecting them. And, and by doing that, doing that and putting them in you know, breaking it up and how was each study done and what were the conditions and what was the response? We can see tr it, there's obvious trends that crash type, you know, the response scenario drives what the number is, right? So drivers respond very differently in a cutoff than in a head on. Mm -hmm. I think we all knew that, right? But, you know, when you see the numbers and you categorize them by crash type, you can clearly see that response times have a trend, and that trend is very simple. The comparative probability of the event determines what the response time is. So think of this. What is more probable? A intersection, path intrusion in daytime, or a mid-block path intrusion in daytime? Yeah, intersection for sure. Unless I'm 16, I might say something else. <laughs> right. <laughs> so if the comparative probability of a conflict is greater at an intersection, then driver response times has been faster at intersections, right? And then at mid-block locations. So if you think of this, then at nighttime, all right, is nighttime 
response time slightly longer because it's nighttime or because it's less probable, right? And uh, and so that's not a really clear answer, right? We know response time is a, is about a tenth of a second longer at night than daytime. And so some people say, well, a tenth of a second longer. Oh, my God, it's nighttime. Well, understand, we got to define terms. And, and if we're measuring response time from a point where the hazard is easily identifiable, you know, conspicuous, discernible, well, why is it going to be so much longer at night, right? Yeah. So I ask everybody, do you, res- do you respond a lot longer at night to a yellow traffic signal than, a, than at daytime? And they say, no, I go, well, why not? Because it's conspicuous. <laughs> yeah. And exactly. That seems like one of the bigger challenges with nighttime is what right. is conspicuous? What, what is detectable or discernible? Right. And, and once something becomes, you know, exceeds a recognition threshold where a driver c- can know the true character and the true location of that hazard and the, and the true path of that hazard, then, then it, we can start the clock on perception response time, but not until then can we start the clock on perception response time. Yeah. And your master's thesis, I know as an SAE 2003 paper, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and that was, was that the first, your first attempt, first of all, and potentially even the whole community's first attempt at quantifying the inputs that affected perception response time? and what things actually mattered, like a statistical analysis of, well, what is going to change a human's response time? That, that, was, my f- first, that was my first um, success, I should say, right? Yeah. Uh, there were... <laughs> a lot of attempts. You know, well, uh, I followed... Uh, Edison's advice that every failure is, is another step closer to the answer. And, uh, I, I, I have led a blessed life with some great teachers. And, um, and so one of my professors at University of Hartford, uh, you know, I'm running the stats by him. I'm looking, I'm showing him all, you know, my huge database of all studies. And I had a study by Gazes, re- response time to traffic signals, and study by uh, Olson, response time to yellow piece of foam in the road, and, and resp- you know, st- study by uh, Neil Lerner from Westat of a barrel being rolled into the path of a car and 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 Elizabeth uh, Mousy uh, from NHTSA, she, you know, her and Dan McGee from Iowa did su- studies together, and I I had them all in one database, and she had vehicle path intrusion studies, and and uh, Doctor Breyer looks at my database and he says, "My God, Jeff, you're averaging avocados and elephants." <laughs> <laughs> I looked at Never her heard like, that one. I have I have no effing idea what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Like that was my thought. And and but now I look at it and I see the crash reconstruction community, and still I, I just peer reviewed a paper not even a month ago where somebody uh took the sharp two data took all the different studies, all the avocados and the elephants, and put them in one pile and tried to average them. Hmm. And I'm thinking like, well, that's a worthless number, right? So yeah, was it a uh, lead vehicle? Was it a path intrusion? Uh, is it a cutoff? Is that what you mean by separating out a bit? Right. Yeah. So, you know, so he, he concluded that the average response time was somewhere near 1.66 of all the sharp two, all the naturalistic driver uh, research that, you know, were, was done throughout the U.S. Um, from like 2012 to 2015. There were 3,500 drivers that agreed to allow us to monitor their driving. And, and that data was processed by Virginia Tech. And, uh, so here's here's a problem when you lump it all together is what's more common 
a cutoff or a head on? Mm-hmm. Right? Cut off. Gotta be right. Cut off, right? So yeah. in fact, there's 540 cut off near crashes and crashes in the sharp two, right? And those, from what I learned from your teachings, your your response time to those is going to be a lot quicker than a head-on. That's the fastest response time event, right? There are 17 head-on events, right? And uh, so when you average all of them, the head-on events, you know, if, if you have a time to contact of eight seconds in a head-on, your response time might be six and a half, right? So it's yeah. head-on events are just the most uncertain event. Remember what I said before? Probability or uncertainty drives response time, right? Yeah. What's the most uncertain event a driver could face? Head-on. Right. So, (laughs) you know, you don't know what he's going to do. You don't know what you're going to do. You don't know the outcome of that. And, uh, and, and it's a very low probability event. So the uncertainty is infinite in a head on. So therefore response time is nearly infinite in a head on. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you know it's going to happen, you know, you're about to get into a crash, your response is going to be quicker and more decisive in what you choose to do as opposed to that area I imagine in a head-on where you have time to think like are they going to go back to their lane are they going to stay in my lane what's going on should I try to stop should I try to swerve to the left to the right what do I have for room on the side of the road yeah it, well and and here's the thing like if you got a head-on vehicle are you going to spend time to look over to the side of the road to see what's over there Probably or are you not. just going to go there's something over there I'm not going over there Right. Yeah. And so that's the other thing we've found in, in our head on studies is I put a tuft of grass over on the right. Drivers still didn't go over there. A tuft mm-hmm. of grass, right? They could have easily, if they looked over there, they would have seen it's a tough. I put a, a utility pole one time. I put a mailbox one time. Simulation one thing, in sim, simulation study. Yeah. In, in simulator studies. If now, if there was nothing over there, almost everybody went right. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> like with, if I had a nice smooth transition that went from pavement to grass, just about everybody swerves right. Right. If somebody's coming from their left. Yeah. But if yeah, I, how put, often is that true in the real world? Do you always have a guardrail or a telephone pole or buildings right. or something? Right. And so that's the other thing. We put a guardrail over there. No one goes right. Okay. No one. All right. And, and they all, you know, they, they want, went left. Now that's great going left as long as the other guy doesn't crack, you know? And, uh, so it's, it's a very, it's, it's scary to, uh, see some manufacturers and some, uh, standard institutes are still lumping all events together and then saying, well, our standard, our reaction time approach, uh, you know, is, is good for across all crash events. And it really isn't because here's the other really scary thing. When we look at the sharp two data, the naturalistic data, and there's 540 cutoff events and 269 uh, rear end events, uh, something like that. And, uh, something near 270, 235 intersection events where uh, an intruder flies in through the intersection. Those are higher probability events. The response times tend to be uh, the average response times for those events tend to be 1.3 seconds or less for, uh, per- for perception response time. But, when we look at those, we have a lot of near crashes, very few crashes, right? But when we looked at the, at the low probability events, like stopped vehicle on a highway, mm-hmm. uh, uh, U-turns, uh, you know, sudden unintended accelerations, low probability events, we uh, backing events, there's very high response time very high crash risk. And so anybody that's looking at any database and they're not considering the low probability events, they're not looking at crash risk. 
right? They're not looking at the serious crash risk. And that's, you know, uh, I, I saw we, we might be talking about automated vehicles, right? Yeah. That's one of the problems when saying our automated vehicle is as good as a human. Well, it's as good as a, as a human does in near crashes. Does it do good as a human in crashes, right? In mm. crash events. And sometimes, you know, having looked at this, Sometimes the answer is, yeah, you know, sometimes an automated vehicle can think faster than a human can, right? And sometimes humans just have more common sense than a yeah. computer does. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They've seen more situations that they've been able to intel intelligently digest and put into their data bank. No, I'm and not they- criticizing automated vehicles, right? Like some, you know, really they're, The way they've progressed in the last five years even is remarkable. But there's still a couple crash types that are very concerning. And it doesn't seem like they're really looking at the crash data to try to solve those problems. Interesting. Yeah, and I do want to talk about the the, uh, ADAS systems. So the advanced driver assistance systems and autonomous vehicles and things, because it seems like that is going to affect our work. I'm sure it's already affecting a lot of your work. Uh, as I mentioned before, I think we a lot of us thought by now that fully autonomous vehicles, kind of level six or level five autonomous vehicles would be available to us now. They're not really, but we do have a lot of ADAS systems and uh, uh, they are, I imagine, rearing their head in a lot of the cases you're seeing where hopefully the EDR data is detailed enough to tell you, and I'll be curious because you work a lot more of these types of crashes than I do, who initiated the avoidance maneuver and did it do a better job than the human would have done? And there's also a lot of research related to that. So tossed a lot at you there, but what is your practical experience with the ADAS at this point? And how is that research affecting you and maybe even the research that you're thinking of conducting? Well, when you have an automated vehicle involved in a crash that is in, in likely it's going to be level two automation. That means uh, lane centering and adaptive cruise control are, are an, are active in the vehicle okay. uh, when it's in the crash. Now, when you, some vehicles might identify when it was a vehicle initiated uh, action. M- many that I've seen don't indicate whether it was a vehicle initiated action or a driver initiated action. So when you see brakes on at minus 0.4 seconds before impact and the driver tells you, I never saw the pedestrian before I hit him or I never saw the hazard before I hit him. Now, here's the problem with that statement. You know as well as I do, we've heard that statement before and then seen 40 feet of skidding pre-impact, right? Exactly. Yeah. And and so, you know, you get what the driver gives you because, uh, you know, this is – uh, a, a wives' tale that should help us remember to use a proper methodology because we are as biased as our witness, ex, you know, witnesses are uh, if we're not using a proper method. So, you know, I hear a lot of crash reconstructionists say, "Well, witnesses are unreliable," and I said, "And so are experts if they're not using a proper method, right?" If you know, that's the conundrum there is like, uh, I don't know what to do, you know, with these, with, with the, you know, he said he didn't see it. The court is going to treat that like fact, right? And that, you know, if, if you as an expert don't accept that as fact, you're rolling the rock up the hill without yeah. any success, right? I, so, can, I mean, I, how many times have I been to depot and they say, Mr. Peck, uh, your reconstruction is inconsistent with the driver's testimony. And I'm like, it, it, it always is. Um, and anytime, like you said, to your point, uh, when we do get black box data and we have 
uh, information with respect to the vehicle's behavior that is objective, and we compare that to the testimony, it so rarely aligns every once in a while. But that one specifically that you mentioned, I see all the time. It's funny you say that. In my career, it seems like every time I see the reconstruction and I see the evidence, I can see why the witness said what they did. And, uh, you know, I, 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 more often than not, uh, I see why a witness said what they said. Uh, so I've had, I guess I've had pretty good luck in my career. Uh, not too often do you get somebody that's just completely contrary to the evidence. The, the one that you mentioned specifically, I think I see almost universally where they say, I didn't have time to break. I didn't have time to do anything. And when I get video or I get black box data, they usually do. They usually have done something pre-impact. Yeah. So, you know, going back to that AV case, that's when the human factors person or the uh, automated driving expert person uh, really has to work with the crash reconstructionist. And you know how they always say, you know, take the download, but reconstruct the crash. Yeah. And that's one, uh, that's another, yeah, another reason why you should reconstruct your crashes. Even if you have an event data recorder uh, report, because so, sometimes you can, sometimes the evidence can tease out that had to be a vehicle or that had to be a human that did that mm. response uh, when you don't have. And, and there's been a few cases that I just looked at and I say, I have no idea who did the breaking here. <laughs> like, and is that, you know, a, is that a question that you're being asked a lot at this point? Well, every case I have, the f for example, when I teach crash investigators, I will tell them if I work a case with them, if I'm consulting on a case or if I'm just helping them, you know, if they're calling me and, and I'm just helping them out, one of the first questions I'm going to ask of them is how long before impact did the driver start swerving or braking? How long before impact did the driver's maneuver begin? Because what we want to do, we want to have that classical scientific approach of comparing an experimental sample, what this driver did, with a baseline sample of what drivers have done in research in the same response time task, right? In the same crash type. How have other drivers behaved in that same situation. The only way you can do that is if you know what your driver did, right? So if you don't know what he did, you can compare that to what others have done, but you know the question's coming. How do you know he responded at all, right? Yeah. Unless you know who caused the braking at point four or you know, and I say point four because it seems like when there is no the automated emergency braking, uh, many times that's around the time it's going to kick in. And okay. uh, so, if they have AEB in the vehicle and uh, it kicks in, it's probably going to be in that point four seconds before impact time frame. But a lot of drivers. For many crash time, crash events, the 85th percentile responder is somewhere near that 0.4 seconds before impact. <laughs> you know, so, okay. Uh, yeah. So if you see the response well before that 0.4, it suggests to you that the driver was probably involved. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. And so I, uh, I haven't gotten too deep on any of these ADAS cases yet. But part 563, as far as I know, does not require them. Obviously, they don't. And maybe that's something that, that we should look into and talk to the NHTSA about. But it seems like part 563 should mandate that if you have some autonomous system, there's a flag in the black box data, the EDR, that says, hey, we did something here. 
so that it'd be easier for all of us to understand. And then we could go back to that huge data set and figure out how much the systems are actually helping. Well, we know some systems do do that. And then some other systems might do that, but not report it. Okay. Right. Because they're not mandated to. So right. they, yeah. they, they're essentially reporting what they have to. Okay, that's that's uh, that's really interesting. Uh, it seems like that is going to be omnipresent before long. And again, I, I think that a lot of us thought we'd be just f reconstructing fully autonomous crashes at this point. But it seems the more likely scenario is that in five to 10 years, almost every crash will involve a car that has some assistance uh, and might have played a role in the response. Well, one manufacturer said to me that there's generally a 15-year time gap between new technology and when younger drivers get the vehicle. And if mm -hmm. younger drivers are much more likely to crash than experienced drivers, then, uh, you know, if we want to see the 16 to 24-year-old drivers in you know, more advanced vehicles. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's usually going to be like a 15 year wow. delay on that. Yeah. You be can't go buying your car, your, your kid a $60,000 car, which is, you know, nowadays, if you want something that's got all the bells and whistles safety wise, I mean, that's where you're at, right? 50, 60 grand probably. Although I will say I have a, a Toyota Tundra and I think Toyota made some sort of pledge by 2022, all their cars were going to have uh, at least ADAS. Um, uh, on board. And that is helpful. So, and that brings me to my next uh, point, which is interesting. Our next question is not, I don't have a point. I'm, I'm very curious to see if you do. Uh, I'm, I'm used to having conversations with you where you have no point. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's pretty much every conversation, right? <laughs> Except, no, uh, yeah, this I'm time there's kidding. no beer. So there's no excuse for me having no point. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, when we go from 2020 to 2021, we're seeing these huge spike in fatalities. And so it's like 10%, I think it went up. And then ped impacts, pedestrian impacts, for those not with the lingo, uh, went up 13%. And when you look at that combined with the ADAS systems, it's this strange disparity that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Like, shouldn't we be getting better at not hitting pedestrians when a lot of these cars are equipped with pedestrian impact detection and pre-impact braking, um, what, do you know what's going on there? Do you have some sort of speculation? Well, well, the pedestrian problem is an urban, more mostly urban problem. And, um, and so we don't see ped crashes increasing too much in suburban and rural areas, but it's, it's more, well, I take that back. It's, it's, Here's the problem with pe ped crashes, arterial roads, 80 to 85% of all pedestrians are going to hit, be hit on an arterial road. So main street USA kills pedestrians, right? Yeah. And so that's, that's the tagline here, right? So, uh, if you have a 45 mile an hour speed limit road and it's a main connector road between two other connector roads on arterial, Pedestrians are very high, highly likely to be struck on that road, right? So we know when they're, we know where they're happening. Uh, and if we can do a better job, maybe of lighting the roads, a better job of, uh, funneling pedestrians into certain areas, uh, we, we, we see that, uh, when, for example, children pedestrians, are likely to be struck in a place where they don't have protected play, where there's multifamily dwellings. And uh, so they are playing. The road happens to be in their playground, right? right. They We call it a road. A uh, five and six and seven-year-old call it their playground. Yeah, right? it reminds and, me of Wayne's World when they're playing street hockey in the street and it's car, game off. Right. And, 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 and then there, there's balls rolling, I imagine, into the roadway and there are kids chasing balls and things. And that, that could be a natural thing uh, for for their behavior and how they treat roads. And, and so perhaps 
build a park right next to that area, you know, to get them off yeah. the road or perhaps uh, put uh, re- restrictions that uh, a limit. Uh, for example, I was in New York City last during the Christmas season. And I noticed that they don't let you cross. You just can't jaywalk in some areas. You know, they, just, they just, they have fences and walls <laughs> that you can only cross in certain areas. Right. And so that's going to, you know, that's going to improve the probability of a driver. Right. So if the driver has lower probability of a pedestrian in any area, his response time is longer. Than if it's at an intersection, yeah. right? So, you know, we just look at the math and, and if we can have everybody behave in a certain way and cross in a certain location at a certain time, then probability uh, goes up and response time goes down and, cra- and likely crash risk goes down. Yeah, and that makes sense. Back to what you're talking about before. It's just that, that kind of expectancy term where right. are you expecting at night somebody in the middle of a block? to cross where there's no crosswalk, no. So your response time is going to be longer and the odds of hitting that pedestrian, unfortunately, are increased. Yeah. And Uh, and and the car doesn't see... So maybe we had a 13% increase from 20 to 21, but if we didn't have the driver assist systems, it would have been even worse. And why the increase in the first place? Do you think that distraction has something to do with it? I know a lot of your research has been uh, analyzing how drivers respond differently when they're engaged in some sort of cell phone task. Do you think we're still seeing increases associated with just the availability and potentially addiction to shooting off texts and whatnot? Well, we do see in the pedestrians, uh, there's, there's quite a few of them who have, who are also engaged in cell phone use. Mm. And so it's not uncommon. Wow. To have a crash involving two, a, a driver who's intoxicated, a pedestrian who's intoxicated, a driver who's on the cell phone and a pedestrian who's on the cell phone and the two, you know, uns- unsurprisingly sometimes meet. Uh, and yeah. so now you say, okay, he's done a lot of things wrong and he's, and it, a, a has done a lot of things wrong and B has done a lot of things wrong. Uh, but who has done the most things wrong? <laughs> wow. And, I didn't and, even consider that as I was putting this data together and just looking at it. I'm like, I didn't even think of that, but just walking around the airport or any city street that makes a ton of sense. Well, we know, for example, texting walkers have a 17.9% slower walking speed, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, in one study uh, concluded that 17.9% slower if you're texting. And wow. uh, so just like when we're driving down the road and somebody's traveling 63 in, in the high speed lane, mm-hmm. And we'd go by them and they're sure enough, they're on their cell phone and doing something on the cell phone. Well, yeah. we see the same thing when we're walking on a sidewalk, right? And uh, so I know Swaroop likes to have his, you know, uh, funny, Swaroop Dinneker has, has his funny videos of people, you know, texting and, and falling into holes or running into utility poles. And uh, so, Yes, we know they're more distracted, but we also know they uh, they also walk slower. And that's really it, because of that mental burden associated with trying to accomplish whatever task they're trying to accomplish on their phone. And it, yeah, you nail it right on the head. That's that's exactly what they, we believe is going on is they're reducing the workload by moving slower. Right. So they're already got meant, you know, cognitive resources going to the cell phone task and they only have so much more to the walking task. They got so much going to the cell phone task. They only have so much more to the driving task. Right. So, uh, that's why, you know, one of the symptoms is driving slower when you're texting. Yeah. 
right? Or, now, th- well, this is that's really interesting. And now I'm thinking, OK, well, how does this tie in with covid? Because that's where we saw a lot of the spikes. And is there a chance that a lot of people just got more used to consistently interacting with their phone during that period because they're quarantined and then they get out? That's some of it. But you know what? Look, let's let's go back to the one thing. You know, the, the, the Occam's razor, right? The, the yeah. obvious thing is, uh, we've always known that the further away from normal speed you travel, the higher your crash mm-hmm. risk. And so if these COVID, uh, free road drivers are traveling much faster than all other traffic on the road, we know that increased, you know, it, that increased yeah. and increases crash risk. And, uh, you know, and it's a U shaped function, right? It's a, so if we graph it, when you go much slower than average, you increase crash risk by an astronomical amount. If you go much faster, right? The further away you get from normal, you increase crash risk at an astronomical amount. So if you go five, 10 over, yeah. Five over might not even increase crash risk, but 10 over, yeah, you're going to increase it maybe one or two times the normal rate, right? But when you're like 40 times, you know, 40 miles an hour faster, well, now it's, you know, it's uh, logarithmically greater uh, Mm -hmm. crash risk. And and then, you know, back to the, the distraction how do we solve that? Because it does not seem like we as human beings are able to overpower the social engineering associated with a lot of these platforms. And we will text while we're driving. We will scroll through Facebook when you're stuck in a traffic jam or something like that. Uh, have you seen any notable efforts. Uh, it, it seems like there's two potential things you can do here is one, just limit phone use via some technology or two, have the car be there for you. And I have some experience with the latter. I had a Tesla Model Y for a while and it was great. I'm driving from here in Southern California to Arizona or something and I'm on a really straight road and there's nobody around me and I trust the system and I have it start to, to autopilot, quote unquote. And I could fire off a couple texts and I'll just kind of save it. Even just switching a song on Spotify or something like that. If I had that little cocoon of the Tesla to just take over for 30 seconds, it felt great and I could do some things. And when I hop in another car that doesn't have any of those systems, uh, you know, I hate to admit it, but sometimes I'm still doing those. I'm switching songs and things and it just doesn't feel as safe. So removing the cell phone entirely seems like very tough to do. Um, maybe the car can help. What's your take kind of on that tension? Well, you know what? Just like seatbelt usage uh, didn't catch on until we started teaching it to kids in second grade. Mm. And uh, perhaps that's the same approach is, you know, this is, this has to be part of training growing up is that, it's not about you. You just have to imagine, we have seen this, is that families involved in somebody who was driving and killed somebody, there's as much stress in their life, right? Well, I don't, I don't want to measure stress, but there's a lot of stress in their life as well as the family who lost somebody. Right. I, and I'm not comparing. I'm just saying it's, it's a lot more yeah. stress for having a family member involved in a fatal crash than not having a family member in a fatal crash. Right. Yeah. And, um, and so it's, it, you know, it, it, it's just terrible for everybody that's involved in a crash. Uh, and, uh, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. And, you know, if we can somehow uh, teach that how horrible it is for some families, uh, you know, to experience, you know, some of the things that we see, and uh, and that's that. I think that's the only thing that that we we can offer is you know some of yeah. the things that we've experienced. Yeah, I and. 
in the Sharp 2 data, which maybe we should get a little bit more background out there because it's so phenomenal, but I'd be curious to hear. I, I imagine you have some funny stories related to that too, but the Sharp 2, to, 2 data, can you just give everybody a little bit of background about who led that project, exactly what it is, what instrumentation was on the vehicles, and then how that has... I mean, I imagine it's a gold mine for you. So how it has affected your understanding of what's going out on on the roads? Well, you know, let's give you a little background to this. So in uh, in 2003, it, Virginia Tech does a pilot study. Well, they published a paper in 2003 where they had drivers travel 20 minutes to and from work and they put a data acquisition vehicle, uh, data acquisition system in these drivers' vehicles, and just collected data f- f- from these drivers for a two-week period. And at the end of two weeks, they looked at how many times the drivers. They just looked at a couple things in the data. For example, how many times the driver came upon and passed a slower moving lead vehicle. And they found there were 295 events and the average driver, you know, made uh, so many mirror glances and so many glances forward and so many glances to the left and right. And, and that they closed to within about 124 feet of the lead vehicle before they started changing lanes. And so Hmm. clearly they say, wow, we can get a lot of data from this. So they then did, they then performed what they called the hundred car study. So over the course of a one-year period, they equipped 100 vehicles and with uh, accelerometers, GPS speed, network speed. Network speed is like uh, streaming the OBD2, streaming the CDR report. Okay. Forward camera, camera at the driver's face and hands, and then uh, – and allowed these drivers to drive over the course of one year and collected the data. At the end of one year, there were approximately 69 crashes, 28 police reportable crashes, right? Okay. And 741 near crashes. And a near crash is defined as somebody basically locked up the brakes or yanked the steering wheel uh, in an emergency response. But for the grace of God or for some other reason, they didn't crash. Right. And so we, you know, Virginia tech saw all this data. And, and so the logical next step is the data was beautiful. Right. But the one criticism that could be made is, well, that's great. That's where that those were all drivers in Northern Virginia. Do drivers in Seattle and Tampa and Buffalo and, uh, you know, in Indiana and in the Carolinas, you know, if we tested other people, would they before, would they respond similarly? And, uh, and so they more than doubled down on the hundred car study. And so the hundred car study was called the strategic highway research program. So the second strategic highway research program, SHARP-2, they uh, equipped 3,500 3, vehicles that involved more than 3,500 drivers, and they collected data for three years. And so there's been more than 1,000 crashes, more than 228 severe crashes. Wow. Uh there's been more than 3,000 near crashes. And so Swarup Dineker and myself, you know, we decided that in 2015, when data collection for that data set completed, uh, we, uh, we signed a, 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 a user agreement with Virginia tech to process this data. And, um, and, you know, we're, you know, I'm on uh, the expert committee for the, you know, the, for this. Uh, and so we decided we're going to process this data. And we thought we'd publish, you know, we'd publish these, these data 
probably, you know, we had the data in 2015. By 2017, we'll have like six or eight studies done. And, yeah, you know, it's always easy. In, a lot of data. Yeah, at the beginning. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> put it like this. We, we've had universities say they wanted to be a part of the data collection with us. And we told them what's in, involved, that essentially you got to go. There's no easy way. You got to go frame by frame analysis on every one of those 4,600 events. You have to, you know, go through, you know, you, we have like a huge Excel database, E-X-E-L, right? No, yeah, the, yeah. You know, uh, Microsoft Excel, uh, you know, uh, database. And in there is the data that we have to, so we have to extract the data from, from uh, a spreadsheet. The, and, you know, for each event, we're talking at least, at least one, probably closer to four hours of, of data processing of each one of those events. So we've been, we've been extracting that data since 2015. We're almost done with every crash type. So what we did is we handled this, you know, we, we ate the elephant one bite at, at, at a time. <laughs> yeah. And so we handled it by crash type. So we took all the intersection path intrusions, then all the mid block path intrusions, then all the lead vehicle crashes. And then, and then we saw different other crash types. So U turn isn't categorized by Virginia Tech. So we then had to look to, for the U turns and then head on, you know, sometimes, uh, he head ons were categorized as something else. And so we, you have to just, spend the time and extract the data and categorize it. And, and so we're almost all done. Uh, we have, we just have a couple crash types left, uh, to report. And so we, we see how the drivers have behaved in real life and I can report based on everything we have seen so far that the simulator research, the high fidelity simulator research is alive and well, that we do not see any differences between the simulator data and the real life driver response time data when it comes to dri driver behaviors. Now there That's might fantastic. be some, there might be some differences in the way we collect the data, uh, in a simulator in the way we collect the data in a, uh, naturalistic study. But for the driver behaviors, uh, I see both. See, here's the advantage. Simulator studies are more precise. We can exactly target the behavior we want to measure. Naturalistic studies, we get what we get, but it's real life, right? Yeah. And so when you have both and they're both telling us there, you know, studies done in, in China, in Taiwan, in Japan, in, in Europe, in, in, in the U.S., uh, simulator studies, naturalistic studies really doesn't matter. They're all, they all say the same thing if we account for crash type and, and their methodology. And, and that is just so cool to me. And, yeah. um, uh, it doesn't matter what your culture is. doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. No. You're a human, and we can predict how you're going to respond to certain stimuli. And it's based on where the crash happened, where the yeah. crash event happened. Like intersection, path intrusion, uh, mid-block path intrusion, uh, you know, stop vehicle on a highway, or a following closely behind platoon rear render. You know, we, if we categorize them, put them in categories, categories, studies done all over the world come to the same results. That's cool. And I, so I remember you, I'm sure you, well, you might remember this as well. Maybe a decade ago, I came to the HPL lab, human performance lab at UMass yeah, with, Amherst. Without your wallet. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I might've forgotten my wallet. Thanks for the lunch, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, you, <laughs> you, that wasn't part of the payment for being a subject, but I did let you poke and prod me and put me into the simulator study. And, uh, that was really, it was really interesting to see how that whole process went down. I mean, we had the eye tracking system back then. I don't know if it's still the case, but you had to calibrate it so that you could get a really good idea of exactly what 
I was looking at. Um, and I think I behaved a little bit uh, abnormally compared to the rest of your uh, subjects, if I remember correctly. <laughs> I will well, allow you to talk about it. Uh, the, the, I will not call the IRB. <laughs> yeah, we can't talk about uh, human subjects, but no. there was, there might have been one or two um, that, you know, maybe one or two subjects, male subjects, as they aged, uh, their testosterone level dropped just a little bit and they'd become more normal. Um, and that was my hope of one or two of those subjects. And, uh, and so, uh, it does appear that one or two of those subjects that we tested, uh, have matured very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my doctor tells me as well. Uh, that, that, that was it's an impressive setup you have over there and, and doing all this research, looking at sharp two, looking at the simulator studies. I mean, you probably looked at. Uh, more research than anybody. What are, where are humans most vulnerable? So when we're driving, what situations, when they're presented to us, are we most likely to get in trouble with? Well, here's the thing. God made us good at a lot of things, right? But just like, remember Volvo back in the, I don't know, 90s had a seat issue. Right, you make your seat too stiff, you give people whiplash. Yeah, you make your seat not stiff enough, they break their neck in a high speed crash. Right, so you gotta then you know uh, Ford in the 1970s, I think it was with the A pillar issue, make your A pillar too big and you reduce uh, your your search area. Right, make it too small and you crush your roof. Right? So you, yeah. we 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 always have that. Give and take. Well, the same thing is, you know, when we were developed, God put our eyes too close together, right? He put it yeah. together. So, hey, we're really good at detecting motion, a lateral across our visual field, not too good at detecting motion and depth, right? Eyes are two and a half inches apart. We can, we can judge movement this way, but not as good this way, right? So, it, really, there's two things we really, you know, really aren't designed to do. The other thing is, God gave cats a tapetum, right? A tapetum is the reflector in the back of the eye. So, when light goes into a, the eye of a nocturnal animal, right, it goes in, flashes off the tapetum, flashes back, and it echoes. Mm -hmm. And basically amplifies the amount of light and allows nocturnal animals to, to see much better in, in darkness. We didn't get one of those, right? It, apparently it, it, that, that shelf was empty. Maybe it was during a COVID period, right? Yeah. And uh, it was I've with noticed, the, maybe it the was way, with the I, toilet paper. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I notice when I stub my toe on the bed in the middle of the night that I do not have uh, that device on board. Right. So no tapetum. Right. So uh, we're not nocturnal, and we need light. And if we don't get light, we don't do too well. Right. So the two areas that we don't do well, and that you know, just like an airbag, is called a supplemental restraint system, right? It's not like, oh, I got you restraint system. It's a, hey, you wear your seatbelt and I can help you out a little bit restraint system, right? Same thing with, uh, you know, perhaps a mitigation uh, device in vehicles. How about if we work on supplementing what drivers already do well, right? So there's a lot of things we do oh, okay at. Right. And that's detecting path intrusions, w cutoffs where the, f we, we respond very fast in a cutoff. There's, I doubt an automated vehicle is going to improve on our ability to respond to somebody cutting us off because we're already pretty fast in most instances. Right. But finding a dark pedestrian at night, uh, you know, we, yeah. we, that's, that's not our forte, you know, on a dark unlit road at night. That's, you know, 
That's that's a difficult task for a driver. So it's easy for a car to handle with a infrared camera or lidar or something. Well, it, yeah. Well, with lidar, or it, not with a camera system because a camera system is probably not going to be any better than an eye. You know, so mm. uh, you know. But if you have lidar or some kind of system that like that, you can detect movement. Uh, that that would be encouraging. The other thing we don't do is judge collision speed well. And we can see in the owner's manual of, of several manufacturers that, you know, this vehicle doesn't avoid stationary vehicles, right? So, it's, yeah. you know, if you're going to go, you know, and you're really one of those slick guys that found some way to put a clip on the steering wheel of your Tesla so you can go no hands, well, you know, th then you're also a Darwin Award winner because, uh, <laughs> because yeah, you're so smart. You found out a way to kill yourself, even when the car was trying to save you. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if, if think of it this way, if your, if your vehicle is, is detecting hazards with a camera system, right? Are you aware of a camera that's better than the human eye right now? No. I'm not, right? So if we can't judge closing speed until, you know, if closing at 65 miles an hour, the average driver is going to detect closing speed, you know, the rate that they're closing on a stop vehicle on a highway, somewhere around 300 you know, 100 meters away, 340 feet away, something like that, is where the average driver goes, oh, my God. So if that's the first point you can detect it, is a camera system going to be that discerning that far back out in, in fr you know, in free flow traffic and there's, one, you know, one vehicle out there that stopped? So we can see that uh, I'm not aware of a vehicle that can do this right now. Uh, an, an automated vehicle that can avoid that stop vehicle on a highway right now. Yeah, they're still going to hit it. They might get the brakes on pre-impact. And that's what the manual of my car says. It says, hey, we might be able to reduce the severity of that crash, but we're not going to avoid it. And, and my truck is equipped with radar. So, it, you know, if you combine, if you get the cameras farther apart, maybe they have a better ability to detect closing speed. Uh, but they also have to determine whether or not that's a car or a bridge abutment or something like that. And we're probably better at that than the cameras and the AI. Uh, so a combination of systems, maybe LIDAR, radar, cameras is probably the best, but then it has to be also attached to, and I'm not an autonomous design engineer, but also has to be at attached to really sound logic and sound software. Well, leading us to sound logic, right? So back a few years ago, it was, it was fairly popular to, to look into headway warning systems in, in vehicles. And the thought was, well, if you don't follow closely behind, then you're going to reduce crash risk. Well, when hmm. the authors say that, they're not citing the research, right? Because in actuality, if we look at the crash data, you are more likely to be in a crash following farther than three seconds than if you are following closer than three seconds, right? So yeah. th think of that, right? So we've been told our whole lives following closely leads to crashes, right? And perhaps, perhaps it does. And I'm not condoning following closely, right? That Dang, reduces I almost got out of some arguments with my wife just there. I guess, I guess I'm <laughs> that, not winning that, that yet. You're, you're still reducing your resources by following closely, right? You're, you're reducing your available resources by following closely. But that's not leading to crashes. That's leading to near crashes, right? Yeah. So, yeah, you will piss off your wife. Right. You will lock up the brakes you, and you'll probably avoid the crash, but everybody goes home angry, but everybody goes home. Right. 
the crashes. Because it's so easy to detect that change in closing speed from that distance. You you nailed it, right? And, okay. and, and the, think of it. There's a higher probability when you're in a closer distance, right? And so now, you know, you're following one second behind. The brake lights go on. You get an immediate change in following distance, immediate change in the visual size of the vehicle ahead of you. Uh, you have everything but a sign going up saying, stop, stupid, right? Yeah. And uh, so – that event it is a lot of information, a l- very little uncertainty when when that happens. So we respond quickly uh, and we avoid most of those events. But when you're following more than three seconds behind and coming upon a very stopped or slow uh, or uh, very stopped or a vehicle traveling less than 10 miles an hour, that leads to deaths. In mm-hmm. fact, uh when we average the speeds of all crashes in all fatal crashes in the United States, I think people would be stunned to know that the average speed of a driver who got struck at f- five, six, or seven o'clock, in other words, got struck in the rear, the, their average speed in a fatal crash was 12 miles an hour. Wow. The average speed of the car that struck them was 58 miles an hour. Oh, wow. So, I mean, that indicates highway stuff, right? That's it. So, when we look at the fatal analysis reporting system, our U.S. government statistics for 2019 and 2020 that just came out, I've spent quite a bit of time with that data, right? We see that. If you're, tr- if you're on a speed limit of 25, 30, 35, and 40 miles an hour, and you're involved in a rear end crash, if you're looking at a rear end crash, in those, on those speed limits, the following driver is usually always over the speed limit and striking the vehicle ahead. He mm-hmm. is more likely to be unlicensed. Right. And he's more likely to be driving an older car. Right? Hmm. In other words, he's likely to be uh, a younger driver. Right. And we know teens are overrepresented in those crashes. Yeah. When we look at 50, 55, or particularly 55, 60, 65, 70, and 75 mile an hour and 80 mile an hour roads, those drivers tend to be traveling less than the posted speed limit are typically licensed drivers, typically experienced drivers, and it's telling us these are drivers that have fewer crashes, fewer, you know, driving issues, uh, have better driving records, and they're facing a human limitation, right? So in the U.S. today, 4.5 people are going to die today Traveling on a 55 to 70, 55 to 70 mile an hour speed limit road, they're going to be striking a vehicle traveling less than 10 miles an hour, right? Or stopped. 4.5 deaths today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day, right? And, uh, and that's so, you know, it's, it's telling us there's a human limitation. There's a huge problem here. And, uh, I, you know, I'd like to call for more research into this crash type, particularly of automated vehicles. And if your system doesn't reach out that far yet, well, maybe you should start looking into how can we reach out farther? Uh, when I say reach out farther, detect earlier. Uh, yeah. And so it's, a, it's, you know, if it's truly a supplemental system, this is something humans are having problem with. Uh, so it's something I'd like technology to try to look into more. Yeah, that's the perfect area to supplement. Like you said, if you can combine the strengths of the human with the strengths of the machine, then you have a much more robust, safe system that we can hopefully start bringing these stats the other way. Exactly. So the two areas that I'd love you know, automated vehicles to look more into is nighttime and, 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 uh, stopped and very slow vehicles because stopped and very slow vehicles account for nearly 80%, over 70% of all rear end crashes. So I wanted to get into some of kind of the tech and 
trends and where you start seeing things going. And one of the things that I've noticed in my case work, and I suspect you've noticed it as well, is the ubiquity of video, whether it's a dash cam or a surveillance system or a ring doorbell camera, We're just getting video of a lot of crashes at this point. And has that allowed you to have a more detailed and conclusive analysis? How how's that affected your analysis, I guess is a better way to ask it. Well, you know what, really, that was really one of the reasons why I I chose human factors over a mechanical engineering degree. And uh, because I could see, even back in the 90s, that there's more video coming out there's more there's you know, i knew they're going to be putting uh event data recorders in vehicles and so i thought well well i thought back then well we're going to just download the vehicle it's going to tell us the speed of the vehicle and then you're done with your recon right and yeah and you get a video you the video clearly shows you how the crash happened and done. you're you're done right yeah. And now I look at video and go, oh, my God, because I know every case, you know, you're going to get cross-examined on frame 16, you know, on uh, five seconds in frame 16. Notice this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that really a taillight or is that, you know, uh, uh, or, you know, uh, you know, based on this frame, don't you see this or that, you know? And so I know going in on every one of those cases that y- y- you really got to break it down. You got to break down that video. And, uh, and so, you know, it's, it's actually more time, uh, in the video cases. And, and sometimes, you know, somebody will call up and, Hey, I got a video of a crash. So, you know, you, it should be easy for you. <laughs> it's like, no, yeah. it's, that makes it more difficult for us. It, and, but, uh, you know, it's, you know, like everybody says, it's you get out what you put in, right? And for the same reason, I think it really advanced our knowledge of driver behavior because now we get so much more information. And you know, I, I think back when, you know, remember I was saying about my master's thesis and, uh, man, I felt like I was, I started that research in 95 and, uh, I finally, you know, thanks to a lot of good professors and on my committee and, uh, I finally came out with, you know, mathematical models for driver response time because I categorized them, but I, I had to learn you know, how to do that. And, and the only way to learn rules for behavior is to get a lot of data to see violations of the rules. Right. So, you know, and, and that's, that's how I learned is, uh, well, you know, we know, uh, drivers before perform in this certain way. And then you get another study and you say, you, or you get a video and you say, whoa, that's an exception to the rule. And then you get another video. Then you get another video. Then maybe somebody publishes a study, right? And normally you'd look at the study and go, oh, it's an okay study. And But now you look at it and, wow, that conforms to the couple of videos I've seen. And then the next thing you know, I have another study. And now you really, you got a new rule. <laughs> yeah. And if you are not worried about being right, then you can always end up finding, you know, finding more things, right? So I don't mind being wrong as long as I'm doing everything I can to find the right answer, you know? And and I, I think that's the way that I've always looked at things and, uh, and so video really gives us tremendous amount of data, tremendous amount of information. So, you know, we have the sharp two data and then we have 
tr- dash cam video of nearly cr- ha- more than half the cases that we get offered. Wow. And uh, it's, it, you know, it's, it's just tremendous to it. So we have the three prongs. So we s- see the consulting cases. It helps us design our research questions, which helps us in our teaching, which helps us help crash investigators who then help us by bringing us more crazy events. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You know? And so every time I teach a class, somebody in the class will come up to me and go, Jeff, what do you call this one? Right? Yep. And and sometimes you go, wow, that is cool. That is sort of like a, you know, that's sort of like a duck bill platypus. You know, you got a little bit of this, but it lays eggs. You know, it's like, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, but that's how, and, and it helps me teach because it helps me define even better. You know, what is a path intrusion, right? So, you know, what is a lead vehicle event? When do you start the clock, right? And, and so the more I teach, the more I gather information, the better I get at defining when perception response time starts, what triggers it, what causes uh, an emergency response over a non-emergency response. You know, what is the response choice of drivers? And the more data you have, the more you say, well, it's usually this, except when you have that, <laughs> you know, yeah. like w- one perfect example is uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jeff Hickman, uh, formerly at Virginia Tech, and now he's in the private sector. He's doing crash, uh, you know, human factors, forensics. And uh, he did a paper uh, looking at the Sharp 2 data, and it, he concluded that not many drivers swerved in the in the Sharp 2 data va- in the Sharp 2 database. And that's essentially what we found back in 2015. Uh, swerving is not a real common response. And uh, but then when we look at the high speed rear enders which Sharp 2 didn't have quite as many of, but dash cam videos do, right? Uh, we see that nearly 70% of the events at 55 to 70 miles an hour involve swerving, right? Hmm. And yeah. so it's, you know, it allows us to explore even more data sets, right? So yes, it only, we only get data from crashes. And, yeah. but the sharp two data gives us data from non crashes and crashes, right? And so again, just like with simulator studies, simulator studies help us understand real life. Real life helps us understand simulator results. And then near crashes help us understand crashes and, 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 and video evidence helps us understand the other research. You know, it just all feeds in to, like I said to you in the beginning, it feeds into that story, yeah. you know, and, uh, and, and, and it's just be- it's, it, beautiful data. I think it just, uh, just all resonates when you put it all together. Once a junkie, always a junkie. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I've seen that too with the the video on the motorcycle stuff. It, it makes uh, makes me really happy to be able to quantify a rider's braking capability as they approach the impact, because there was a, a 100 motorcycle study conducted by MSF in Virginia Tech. Very is very limited. Uh, it's been analyzed uh, by Williams and published. But when I get 50% of the cases I'm getting now, I'm probably in a similar ratio as, as you are, I am getting video that is detailed enough where I can quantify via photogrammetry and video analysis what the speed of the rider was at frame by frame, essentially. So I can quantify braking rate. And that is it's fantastic. And in the cases I'm working so far, the, the numbers seem to be high. Now, granted, it's a very small sample size, but that's something I'm hoping to publish with the help of black boxes that are now being installed on Kawasaki's too. And I imagine though that helps you. So there's two things with the black boxes. One, obviously they're, they're nearly ubiquitous now. 
And I imagine that with that data, sometimes you can quantify perception response time where you wouldn't have been able to otherwise. And then the other thing just to throw in there is I see that there is a notice to proposed rulemaking by the NHTSA to now capture 20 seconds of pre-impact data. And I hope that that comes to fruition. But how is the five seconds generally that we do get now helped you with pre-impact data? And would 20 be even better? Well, it, yes, it would. Because now, one of the things we've seen with emergency response time data is many times, and I'm going to repeat this twice, age has not been a factor, right? <laughs> Which every everybody who you talk to who's a layman thinks that it would, and I understand why. And I've even had judges look at me and put the glasses down and say, you know, you can't tell me age isn't a factor. I know because I'm older, you know? <laughs> And I'm like, well, yeah, it depends how you define terms. If you start the clock when you don't see something and you, you know, and have it tick off until you do see something, well, yeah, it's going to be longer, right? So, yeah. so older folks and younger drivers have problems finding problems. Their problem is hazard anticipation, right? Mm. And slow cognitive, re, you know, slow, they, you know, when you age, you slow cognitively. So where do they crash busy intersections? So where's the best place to put an older driver with slower cognitive resources is fast moving uh, state highways in Florida. There we go. It's sort of like our version of putting old people on an ice flow. Right. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's just, uh, so it's just, if, you know, going left and going right and going left and going right, well, your eyes go left and right when you're age 70 and above, but your brain does not. Right. So it's your eyes go left, your brain then catches up. Your eyes go right, your brain catches up. Right. Yeah. And so, they're going to have difficulty in, whenever they have to look left and right quickly. They're going to have difficulty with that. Uh, but that's not a perception reaction time problem. Now, if there's something there they have to respond to, driving is a neck up task, not a neck down task. So 18-year-olds, they're probably great neck down. But neck up? Yeah. I just, you know, not no. Yet. That, not yet. Not yet, right? So, uh, so people say, well, you know, an eighteen-year-old could respond much faster than an eighty-year-old. Oh, really? Right? Do they know what to look for? Right? So, hazard anticipation. We're going back to that wrapped training, risk and perception training, developed, you know, by Don Fisher and and his group at the University of Massachusetts Human Performance Laboratory, and we we know. That if you, you, we can train drivers to anticipate hazards better. So how do you anticipate a hazard? By, well, number one, look at it, right? So if you're looking at the hazard, you're anticipating it. And then do you have a mitigation to go with that, right? So do you come off the throttle? Do you move? Or is there a need to to uh, to mitigate in any way other than just look at it? And 90% of the time, just looking at it is going to help you mitigate the hazard right so you're anticipating what what your next hazard is so if we can look back 20 seconds before the event we get better hazard anticipation information right so now we can we can better identify what does a 40 year old driver who has no crash history what is his speed choices uh in you know, in the time period 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4 seconds before impact. And what is the teen driver's speed choices in that same time period, right? And and so I think what we'd find when we collect more data back there is that if well, let's 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 just compare the routine 40-year-old driver with the routine 17 year old driver on a straight highway with a 45 mile an hour speed limit. 
the the experienced driver in that road will likely be traveling about one mile an hour faster than the average 17 year old right hmm. and they're probably both slightly above the speed limit but the experienced driver is probably about one mile an hour faster right and that's generally what I found in in some of the studies I've done but when we then have some kind of hazard, recognizable hazard present. So there's nothing to lock up the brakes for, but just something that looks a little yeah. uneasy squirrely. up ahead, yeah. squirrely up ahead, right? Maybe a pedestrian, uh, you know, s- walking along the fog line up ahead. The, the experienced driver is likely going to come off the throttle for that. Right. Likely give a little anticipation, you know, might move slightly in his lane for somebody standing on the fog line and he's in the right lane. But a novice driver, if he does mitigate at all, it's going to be likely going to be very late in the event. Right. And, uh, and he might not at all. Right. He, he might say, well, you know, I have the right to do this. I'm, I'm in the middle of my lane. I, you know, yeah. they're, they're, they're very right and wrong oriented. Right. And that's what we see sometimes in the studies that we've done. That's what we see, you know, in, uh, in, in psychological development, like Kohlberg, the, the, the famous psychologist, he called kids in their teens that that was the good boy, good girl orientation, right? So in, in other words, teens view themselves as good or bad, never halfway, right? Yeah. Like I'm either the most popular or I'm not popular. I'm either the funniest or I'm not funny, right? And so thinking back to high school, I think we all thought that way, right? Like if you weren't the most popular, you know, you were – not popular, right? So, yeah. And, uh, and where you, you know, might have been a 90th percentile, that's pretty cool, right? But you don't view yourself as a 90th percentile. You view yourself as, oh, yeah, I'm one of the, you know, as, you know it's the funny that you say that. Yeah. My, my mom yeah. growing up would always say, you might be right, but you're going to be dead right. And, yeah on the road with respect to the road. And I remember that. And now certainly I, I see things more as, well, I don't care who's right or wrong. I just want to make sure that there's no incident. Well, you know, I, I think I told you one time uh, about a, uh, the, one of the studies I did where we were testing novice drivers at nine events that we know are the nine most likely crash events by teen drivers. And I set it up so if you gave me a little mitigation, in other words, if you look towards the hazard and reduced your speed just slightly, you never got the emergency response time event. Mm. So if you gave me mitigation, you got no, you know, uh, cra- immediate crash hazard, right? And when I ran experienced drivers through these nine events, it wasn't uncommon that somebody got out of the car, looked at me and said, Jeff, you know, I, I kind of thought that you were going to give me the big whammy. You know, they, they, you know, they got in the simulator. They, they were yeah. all ready, you know, they're, they're ready, you know, to, to, to do well. And, uh, particularly, you know, when I had crash investigators, cause I wanted experienced drivers who drove yeah. for a living. I wanted, exemplary drivers with no crash history, right? Uh, to be my my template for what a good driver is, right? So I had taxi drivers, bus drivers, uh, uh, you know, anybody that drives more than 15,000 miles in a year generally drives as part of their job and had no crashes in the previous year. What did they do? Then I got the teens in there, right? And I, and so... In the experienced drivers, they got out of the car and they said, well, why did, you know, I didn't get any whammies. And I said, yeah, I gave you nine, but you gave me the ounce of prevention and you didn't get, you know, nothing materialized. But I had one young woman who was in the, uh, 
in this study, she crashed four times hmm. and she got out of the vehicle and she started yelling at me that I was uh, getting my kicks out of making her crash. <laughs> and what really was insightful for me with her was that many teens and, and Matt Ramoser, a colleague of mine, uh, did a study, him and Wilhelm, uh, uh, Vac, Vacveld from Suave, S-W-O-V over in mm -hmm. Europe, uh, uh, a driving safety agency over there. They did a study to look into if a teen driver crashes, does he learn from the crash? And in some studies, we found that that's true, that in, in my studies, I found that if they crashed early in the, in the study, they got better as the study progressed because they, they figured it out. Oh, a, a vehicle can come from where I don't see it. Right. Oh, I don't have to necessarily see the vehicle to have a hazard. Right. Yeah. Just and, a, just an environment or a situation. Yeah. So, uh, for example, the left turn across path opposite direction. Uh, in the Sharp 2, there were, I think, something like 269 events where a, a vehicle came out from behind an obstacle, right, in, in, in the Sharp 2. So, that's a common crash or near crash type where, you know, but still, you got you have to have a recognizable hazard there. You have to have, like, for example, what we did is we had a big truck blocking the view of the intersection, and the driver had a green ball traffic signal and clear sailing based on what they see. But if they anticipate, they can know, well, why is the truck stopped in the left lane? Why, if he's going to turn left, just turn left. But if he's stopping, why is he stopping, Right. Well, experienced drivers gave us the ounce of prevention. They slowed down. Sure enough, a car turned in front of that, you know, obstacle. Yeah. Experienced drivers usually didn't crash. Teen drivers usually crashed, right? They went through that intersection at speed and they said, well, I had a green light. I was right. Yeah, I was right. I was right. I'm right. It's so, yeah. again going back to that Kohlberg's moral stage of right and wrong. Right. I'm I'm either right or I'm wrong, and and you know to understand, you know when we show that and and then they go, oh yeah, so somebody can come. You know, okay, I got to make sure the intersection is clear before I enter. Right. And yeah. so it, you know, it, it's teaching them a rule. So now they face a different set scenario and maybe it's not a left turn across path but they know they can't see around a vehicle and maybe they give us an ounce of prevention and nothing materializes right? uh, and it sounds like it would be great obviously it's probably not financially practical but to get a lot of teens into simulators and teach them that way by presenting them with real situations that are perceived to end in a crash and they can learn quickly from it well you know what that the research suggests that has been very effective. If we can get teen drivers in a simulator for, you know, 10 to 20 hours, they, their crash rate does drop. The only problem is, uh, we can't really expect every driving school throughout the country. Right. To get a driving simulator. So what's the next best thing? And that's essentially what guided our research towards RAPT, Risk and Perception Training, and then the research I did on ACT, uh, the, the ACT program, uh, the mitigation program. And it's more of a video game, getting teams to play like a video game that they learn through clicking on the screen where to look, where to put your foot, and where to, you know, where to move in your lane, if that's necessary. Yeah, no, I love it. And I would absolutely, my kids are already addicted to video games. So uh, if I can have them playing one that is going to potentially save their life someday, I, I'm game for that. So with respect to some tools, right now, I imagine when you started your career and you had to do nighttime photography with a film camera, it was a nightmare. 
But what what kind of tools are you using now to document sites and vehicles? Uh, you know, scanners, drones, fancy cameras, contrast. What 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 kind of tools are in your kit for that? Well, there's a, there's a couple things, and um, but I'll I'll say there's one that really stands out uh, for us, and um, well, of course we use this contrast gradient uh, to to help you know document our photographs. But the Sony Alpha 7S2 and the mm. Sophie, so, Sony Alpha 7S3 that just came out last year uh, is a game changer. It's, uh, it's the best investment I've made in my career. If you're a poor photographer, it'll make you a, a good one. If you're a good photographer, it'll make you a great one at night. And, and so, with me, I'm very interested in documenting how the site looked to me and in a fair and accurate way. And, you know, with, with that and the contrast gradient, I, 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 I think it really, it really does a great job. And, uh, I, I think to myself, Oh my God. It was just so hard before. It was this, uh, you always had your choice. You can choose a photograph that looked really grainy, but the lights didn't glow. Or you could, cho- you know, ha- have big blooms, big blooms of light and a nice photograph, right? And so you, you had to pick and choose, but now yeah. that camera is so light sensitive that uh, I can drive down the highway, and and we do. We drive, you know. Sometimes we're left to driving down the highway at sixty five miles an hour or seventy miles an hour with the camera mounted to our vehicle and taking video and getting, you know, we can stop frame. Wow. And zoom in and see, you know, gouge marks and skid marks, and uh, it's 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 just beautiful. It, That's now amazing. it's only twelve meg. It's only twelve megapixels, so it's um, if you're doing fine detail, uh, you know, your daytime camera is going to, you know, your twenty twenty four megapixel camera is going to be better than. Um, than this 12 but the the strength of this is we do a lot of nighttime yeah you know we do a lot of nighttime investigation so we love the high speed uh you know with with film speed you'd have 100 speed film and 400 speed film yeah and then the you know canon and uh, nikon came out with the 6400 speed iso well this goes, you know, it's not uncommon that, you know, we have it set over a thousand ISO. Uh, well, I'm sorry, a hundred thousand ISO. Oh, wow. You know, and, uh, so I'll, I'll set the ISO to a hundred and like a hundred and two thousand, set the shutter speed to, uh, less than one four hundredth of a second and drive down the highway. And sometimes I, I've been able to take photographs of vehicles coming right at me, shooting right into the headlight of a vehicle coming at me. And yeah, you, you need speed for that. You need your camera to be fast and light sensitive. Otherwise you can have big blooms and nothing else, you know, big white light and a lot of black stuff. Right. And, uh, and this allows you to do that. And so, uh, we've been very, very pleased with that. We're very pleased with the light meters now, whether it be the handheld reflectometer uh, or the uh, or the Konica Minolta luminance spot luminance meter or the light meters we have. Uh, we we probably spend goodness we probably spend about four thousand dollars a year just in cal- in certifying light meters. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> not, yeah, not even the purchase of them, just certifying all the light meters we have, and uh, so it, and it makes it really, really fast to, to 
to get the lighting of a headlight, you know, so you, you, you know, we have a series of light meters in one click. We can get like 10, 10 readings at once, you know. Yeah, I remember mapping headlights with you probably 10 or 15 years ago in some cold New England day outside in a big parking lot. And we we just had one on a total station stick and would go out and kind of map out the the point three, I guess it was, right? Remember that? Yeah. And and it, you know, it would take us, I think, I think, you know, the night we were out mapping headlights, you and I, um, I think we we probably spent two and a half hours per per vehicle. Something like yeah. that. I think we yeah. were out there at least four hours for two vehicles, you know? Yeah. And now we could probably map a headlight in, uh, you know, high beam, low beam, and one headlight out in something like 20 minutes. Oh, wow. So, you, you yeah, know. you really refine that process. You want to refine the process? Hire somebody who grew up in India right? And have them come out and map headlights with you in February. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Yeah, we are going to find a better way to do this. This is ridiculous. Yeah, I'm cold. And the next the next day, Swerb Dineker had a whole setup sitting next to my desk, right? And I went, so is this the new way we're going to be mapping headlights? And he said, yes. And I was like, it only cost 10,000 extra dollars. But (laughs) So I've seen, you know, I, I've been tangentially involved in a lot of these human factors analyses and seen experts like you mapping uh, the effects of overhead lamps and just ambient lighting and the headlights of a car. And that that data obviously means something to you. The numbers mean something to you. But then you have to portray that information to a jury and help them understand what it means. So taking the right photograph... So what what tactics are you currently using to present the information to a jury so that they can, I imagine they have to see it, right, for the most part? And, and if that's the case, how are you doing that? Well, and that's always, a, 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 you know, a difficult task is, is uh, some, some, some crashes call to be reenacted and some just can't be. And, um, and, and so that's, that's always the the problem we face with that. Uh, some sometimes the best we can do is draw diagrams and say, you know, here's how the math works. Here's the wonderful thing, though, is light is additive, and you know that that's a simple concept. So, if you have, for example, if you put your light meter, and- oh, you got one. I I I had the feeling that at some point we're going to talk about a light meter. Right? Yeah, that's funny. So this is uh, one of the uh, less expensive light meters. This is the XTEC uh, XTEC LT three hundred, right? And so here's the uh, external probe, and uh, you can get this NIST certified for about 300 bucks, but I can get it online for about 140 bucks without a certification. Uh, and you know what? Good bang for the buck, right? We tend to use the Konica and Minolta. They're more expensive, but uh, a lot of times this will do the job for you, right? But uh, so if I get my light meter here, if I turn this on, right, and... So I can get a reading here, right? So how much light is coming at me? So I uh, I have lights aimed at my face so I don't look as old as I am, right? So <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so if I uh, turn it, you know, away, if I, you know, turn it more down, you can see the reading goes down, right? And I turn it more towards the light, the reading goes up, right? So... Uh, you can get the amount of light from a street light, right? And then you can get the amount of light from a headlight and you can add it up. And is it enough light to illuminate that pedestrian? And, uh, and so you, you know, you can do it graphically. I've seen some people do just wonderful jobs, uh, drawing graphs and showing this, you know, when the car is this far away, 
there's X amount of light here. When it's this far away, there's X plus 10, right? Uh, yeah. Lux. And then, you know, and you can just add light to what light is there, wherever the pedestrian was or okay. the yeah. object, right? And uh, so that's usually the, the easiest way to explain it is, uh, but one thing that uh, we, we caution when it comes to nighttime is light is only one measure that you, we really have to consider the acronym CLAPS, contrast, lighting, mirror probability, uncertainty, right? The, you know, if, if you have a satellite falling from the sky, that's really an uncertain event and it might be a white satellite with a light on it. And you're going to hit it full speed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I remember that uh, tennis ball study, you know, that you did a long time ago where you hung the tennis ball with retroreflective tape right in the driver's path and everybody hit it, right? I think everybody hit it, everybody even though it's it. very detectable, but it doesn't make any sense to you. There's nothing to tell you to stop. And, and the sp- surprising thing is that people that hit it, we ask them, did you see it before you hit it? And more than 70% said, yes, I saw it before I hit it. And so you say, why? And they go, I thought it was attached to something off the road, which right. you look at it and you say, how could you think something right in front of your face is attached to something off the road? And that's the one thing, you know, that's one of the biases that you know, a proper methodology will eliminate. A lot of post-impact investigators might look and say, oh my goodness, I can see that light from 692 feet away, which is, which is what our subjects could see that light from, 692 feet away. But they all hit it. And uh, so there's a difference between, uh, between, between uh, visible and recognizable. Now, I sent you a sentence last night. Yes. I saw that. I uh, I hearted it because it was fantastic. How many Fs? Uh, uh, how many Fs? Yeah, finished files are the results are, uh, are the result of years of scientific study combined with the experience of years. So, how many Fs are in here? Yeah, is the question. One, two, three. I th- I, I say three. Okay. Failed. Is that your final answer? I'll give you a second chance. Okay. Finished files, too, are the results. Oh, interesting. I didn't count the ofs as far as I can tell. There One, we go. Two. So what is up with that? You set me up for, for podcast glory here. <laughs> so that's a, that's a common, you know, like psychological thing. Like, uh, so read that sentence again, right? Read that sentence again. Finished files are the result of years of scientific study combined with the experience of years. So did I miss three Fs then during my first count? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, All the Fs. And, and so now as a post-impact investigator, we look and we go, there, there's six Fs out there. How did he miss six Fs, right? Yeah. Well, we are programmed to look for certain things in certain areas, right? And uh, if we have a violation of our expectation, if we have greater uncertainty or lower probability, right, our response suffers. And so of that acronym CLAPS, Contrast, Lighting, Anticipation, Pattern, and Size, pattern is the big P, right? And and so if something is different than the pattern, like, so for example, animals would camouflage, you know, fur or, or skin, right? That pattern allows them to evolve. And now we have a pedestrian wearing, uh, carrying a flashlight, wearing all black clothing and carrying a flashlight. Let me ask you, is that a pattern? Right? Uh, no. And that's the answer is no, right? Next, a pedestrian wearing all black clothing carrying a white bag, right? Yeah. Big white grocery bag, right? Now, I hear a lot of times, well, it's a big white grocery bag. You'd see the white grocery bag. And I'd ask them, well, I'm driving down the road 
And let's see, let's assume I see a rectangular white object floating down the road, right? Do I know what it is? <laughs> Do I know where it is? And this is one of the things that people neglect. A driver has to know where it is. If you don't know what it is, it's impossible to know where it is, right? And because it could be a big, big white thing far, far away or a small white thing very near, right? Which that could tennis be a big, ball yeah, study big uh, light just ex- or a flashlight, right? So if we don't know what it is, it's, it's nearly impossible to locate where it is. And if we can't locate it in our path, When's the last time, if you are tri- truly driving with a hairpin trigger, right, and you're really anticipating as best you can and highly alert, right, when's the last time you got bug-eyed, white-knuckled, locked up the wheels, smoked the tires, only to learn that it was a false positive, only to learn that there was nothing there to respond to. Yes, right? it never happened. It doesn't happen, right? And the reason it doesn't happen is because the driver has to be relatively sure of what they see before they're willing to lock up the brakes, right? And if we understand that is the way we drive, that's the way, that's what an ordinary driver does. No matter what state you look at, whether the, whether it's Texas and Illinois that says ordinary driver or, uh, you know, I think Connecticut says prudent driver or something, a reasonable driver. Other states use some kind of term like that. Ordinary, reasonable, prudent, uh, driver, right? If this is what ordinary, reasonable and prudent drivers do, right? Then that's the standard of care that we had to hold drivers to, right? And that's, that's the numbers. That's the numbers we were comparing our driver to, right? Now, can auto manufacturers and road designers improve on that? Well, yeah, sure, yeah, they can. But can we improve the human? <laughs> uh, well, doesn't seem like it's happening. Not it's, not for a million years or so. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll have to evolve uh, a tapetum or something, you know, to see at night. You know, yeah, that would help with my uh, be- my my nighttime woes as well. Or blue eyes. Really? So people yeah. with blue eyes yeah, can one see... Blue, one blue this way and one blue <laughs> that way. Right? I, I figured it must be a setup. Right. I'm like, I'm not a biologist on any uh, stretch right. of the imagination. So but. every time I see this one character on uh, SpongeBob that has eyes like out here, and I think he would not hit a stop vehicle on a highway, right? Because, you know, he has eyes out here, right? Yeah. So, uh, but for us. Yeah. Uh, Unless you can move those, you're, you're going, you can't detect that swell rate, that closing speed uh, accurately. Uh, not, that's yeah, interesting. Not in, t- not in time to avoid the crash in many instances. Yeah. yeah so that's where we need that machine help. Like we were saying earlier, I, uh, I love that, that, that idea of combining the strengths of the human with the strengths of what machines are capable of. And it seems like we're heading down that path with ADAS and it's becoming omnipresent and not that expensive. Uh, you can get well, on, a, on, a, on a brand new Corolla, you know? Sometimes, sometimes. But then other times I'll sit through a conference of human factors people and safety people and automated vehicle people, and they'll spend half the conference discussing how a car can better communicate in curtsy to a pedestrian, right? And so I ask, how many crashes does that lead to, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's there's a lot of research now to get a automated vehicle to behave like a human. And so as humans, we look at pedestrians, sometimes we can make eye contact, we go, gotcha, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, go ahead. Right. Yeah. But how many times do we investigate crashes where the pedestrian says, I looked him right in the eye and then I started crossing and he hit me? <laughs> yeah. No. 
it's usually I looked in the cockpit and I saw that they were going the other way, but I went anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, or we get both, you know, or I saw the pedestrian and he looked like he was going to stop. So I kept going. Right. Yeah. And so we know there's miscommunication among drivers, but sometimes I, I, I hear researchers act as if, you know, drivers got it and automated drivers should get it. And they're looking at these jockeying events that if they do lead to crashes, they're very low delta V events and not likely going to seriously injure somebody, right? And so we think, you know, look at that pedest- look at the gap acceptance research that most pedestrians, if a car is within, you know, if the car is more than six seconds away, he's going to cross. If the car is less than five seconds away, he's probably not going to cross, right? And so there is no behavior back at that distance, right? There is no, I see you six seconds away, right? So, yeah. you know, we, we see some, some researchers are researching what they think is important as rather than looking at what the crash data tells us is the problem. And I, I, I think we should first look at the crash data, right? And so I, I really praise some researchers that, you know, there's some great researchers doing some great research and they're looking at the crash data and saying, how do we fix this problem? And that approach, that really excites me. And yeah, uh, because I, I view like, Going back to before, data tells us a story, right? Data tells us behavior. And and data is like real-life crash data is like scouting the enemy, right? And so if we want to better attack the enemy, if I were to tell you that all crashes, you know, all attacks are going to come from your front, from your front wall. Well, why would you put equal amount of troops on all four walls? Yeah. Right? So why would you put all your research into all four walls if you know, for example, 80% of all pedestrian fatalities occur on arterial roads? Why would you then do a research study on a residential road? Right. Yeah. And I, that's, it's, we're all subject to that in all of our work where you're very efficiently pursuing something that's not the problem. You know, it's like, right. well, I worked all day on this and I did a great job, but actually that didn't matter at all. You should have been working on this instead. And uh, identifying what this is, is very important before you start marching down that. Same path. thing with, we're with rear end crashes when. When more than 70% of your crashes involve a lead vehicle that's traveling less than 10, why would 90, more than 90% of your research be two vehicles traveling the same speed? Yeah. Yeah. And those are only going to be minor. Yeah. Minor incidents. Yeah. 90% of all the human factors rear end crash studies involve two vehicles traveling the same speed, which doesn't really lead to crashes. And as we know, if it does... It, uh, it's a very low change of velocity and likely very low speed and likely no injury if there is a crash. And somebody could even argue that those crashes improve the gross national product. And, uh, because it employs auto, uh, you know, auto repair shops and it, it employs taxi drivers and it employs, you know, so, you know, I'm concerned with all events that I can't press control Z. Yeah. Right. You're right. So in other words, if I can't do an undo, if I can't make everybody back a hundred percent in a month or so, yeah, then I'm, I'm concerned about that event. And, and it's uh, worth your effort. That's w- that, that's where my effort is going to uh, be focused on. I love it. I think that's really important. Uh, it, so switching gears a little bit more of kind of a pointed question in going with in attending these conferences and rubbing elbows with a lot of autonomous vehicle researchers. Do you have a take right now 
And it seems like we're all going to be wrong when we make this estimate. But when fully autonomous vehicles will be the majority of cars on the road? Good question. My personal opinion, not based on any research. Yeah. Right? It's all feeling, it seems, at this point. Yeah. And and I, I'd i say the manufacturers could give you a better answer if they are allowed to be honest. Uh, but... Uh, I view partial or auto, autom- automation very much like uh, Volvo did. Uh, for example, one of the, one of their researchers, he's now at Waymo, uh, Trent Victor, mm. uh, gave a presentation, and he said the automated vehicle issue is the pop up problem. So anybody that follows baseball or watches baseball knows that every once in a while the pitcher will throw the ball and the hitter won't hit it well and it'll go straight up the ball will go straight up in the air and it's so easy to catch that it creates a dilemma and the pitcher looks at the catcher and the pitcher looks at the first baseman and the first baseman says you got it And the pitcher goes, no, I I think you got it. And Mm. then the pitcher goes, no, I got it. And then the first baseman says, no, I got it. And then they go, no, you got it. I got it. And then they both watch the ball as it lands on the ground. Right. Yeah. Seen that. (laughs) And, and so Trent Victor referred to automated vehicles as the pop-up problem because and, and, and it's even worse because the better the vehicle is at, tr- at, at earning your trust, the worse you're going to do when it fails, right? So when that automated vehicle feature goes off and then something transpires, right? If it went off, it went off for a reason, probably because you're going around a curve or because, you know, now the road, it, you know, the road lines aren't there anymore or, you know, your degree of difficulty for your car just got more complex. It probably got more complex for you as well, right? So, yeah. so now you're entering a more complex area and the car just dumps you back to manual mode, right? And the more engrossed you were in whatever you were doing when you were in automated mode, the slower you're going to be to come out of that, right? And so that's the problem is the better the car, the slower the driver, right? Yeah, that makes and sense. So they're they're you could trusting say, the system and they're kind of checked out. Right. Now, if you, and this is why some manufacturers – I've noticed there's a couple manufacturers that came out with vehicles in the last couple of years that they used to have lane centering. Now they have lane keeping. Now, basically, why would a manufacturer take away a feature, right? And the reason they'd take away the feature is because they saw their drivers were trusting them too much. And so now rather than having lane centering where you go, you hoo, I got no hands. Now you have lane keeping. So now your vehicle bounces between lines, right? And so now it's your car is telling you, dude, you got to be on your steering wheel. Otherwise you're not in control, right? Yeah. And so unless you're going to just bounce between lines, uh, and trust the system when, you know, there's no reason to trust it, right? So you're more likely going to keep your hands on the wheel there and you're going to say, okay, that's a nice feature because it's supplementing the driver. It's telling you, you know, you drive the car, we'll help you stay in your lane, right? And so that's one feature, you know, I... I I th- I know there's one vehicle that did that. Uh, I think there's been a couple models that went away from lane centering to lane uh, keeping, and f- and I think it's likely due to that reason to to let the driver know you're in command. And uh, 
And so some, I've heard some engineers from, from companies uh, suggest that they think the best approach is to, you know, if you're going to attack a hill, conquer it. If you're going to take control of a vehicle, take control of the vehicle, right? It's either the driver's in charge or the car's in charge, right? And, yeah. uh, and so, you know, driverless vehicles, some people, some, well, some, one or two manufacturers have gone right to, you know what, they're not even interested in the levels of automation. They're just looking into driverless vehicles and because they, they have just flat out deemed yeah. that they can't get there from here going part way. That handoff, yeah, is too cumbersome. Uh, that, and that makes sense is uh, it, you just either supplement and help them in a time of crisis or drive the car fully. But if you're going to ask them to take over in an emergency situation, the research, it sounds like, has been pretty clear so far that that is not going to end well quite often. Well, you know what? Uh, I, 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 I don't want to say it doesn't end well quite often, but um there are instances that it might not end well, right? Okay. Rare instances, but, but there are still instances, you know, there's no, er, er, everybody should be striving to get a little bit better all the time, you know? Uh, but I'm sure you've experienced the same thing. A, a vehicle with level of automation five years from now is a completely different vehicle than a vehicle with level of automation today, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that that that's going to be interesting to watch that evolution and see how far they go. And I know some companies have done it uh, pretty well. Tesla obviously has the full self-driving out now. And you see if you're on Twitter, uh, scrolling the internet, people driving from San Francisco to LA without ever intervening. And that seems to be going well at times. And then you have GM with their super cruise and they're like, we're going to map out every road. And once we get that road mapped out, then you can use the system. And that seems to be working pretty well as, uh, as well. But once you get into the more free for all and are asking for full autonomy in on any street with, you know, a lot of autonomous vehicles interacting with each other, it seems like a, well, it's obviously been a very difficult task to, to handle. And I think everybody thought it'd be a little bit easier than it was uh, at the onset. Well, and, and, and then what about the owner that has a Cadillac Super Cruise and then they go buy a Tesla mm. and both manufacturers have a very, very different approach to how they handle that. And so, uh, Cadillac has the approach that they're going to be the school marm. And they're going to make sure you obey the rules, right? And they, they have their ruler and they might slap your he knuckles every once in a while and put your hands on that steering wheel, young man. Otherwise, we're going to turn off on you, right? And they're constantly, you know, they, you, you know, if you don't keep your hands on the steering wheel, you're going to get a warning, right? And, <laughs> and if you're a little overtired, you're going to get a warning, right? Uh, so I was doing a reenactment, probably two o'clock, you know, the typical reenactment, two o'clock in the morning, and I think probably driving to the airport. And I get the warning that you should pull over <laughs> and take a nap. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it's like, I'm I'm not tired. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. I don't understand why this went off on me. You know? Oh man. Uh, and uh, on that front, you know what what's going to change in the next five years with the autonomous vehicles? How do you see the industry as a whole, not not just autonomous vehicles, but kind of collision investigation changing in the next five to ten years? How do you think that that's that evolution is going to continue? Well, you, you, you know, uh, I came in at a beautiful time that, you know, it's like, I felt, I feel like I learned 
as the profession grew, I learned with the profession, right? There wasn't as much to know when I started in crash reconstruction, right? Now, it's far more sophisticated than it was, and it's only going to get more sophisticated going forward, right? And uh, and so I just, you know, I, I just see the need, need for a team approach that, uh, and we're starting to see it now more in, in, in uh, litigation as well, you know, that it's not uncommon. Uh, well, early in my career, it wasn't uncommon that it'd be, you know, me, one expert against one expert, right? And now uh, it's not uncommon that there's, uh, you know, one automated vehicle expert and one uh, expert that downloaded the vehicle and, and, you know, imaged the vehicle and another expert that, you know, looks at biomechanics and a third one that looks at accident reconstruction, a fourth one that looks at human factors. And, and uh, it's, it's uh, I would say, Almost half the cases we have, there's a, there's teams of experts, you know, um, many, multiple experts in, in the case. And, and I, I, I don't see it getting any simpler than that because there's just, there's just a lot of information in our field, you know, and, and now we got, you know, people, you know, going out mapping, uh, vehicles that we can compare. You know, this light point company and, you know, and, yeah. we, and, and then somebody else going out and teaching how we can do photogrammatical analysis. And, uh, heard of that. And, too. uh, you know, so, and, and I sit through that class and I say, yeah, I'll hire Lou if I, <laughs> 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 I just, uh, you know, I look at that and I go, okay, I, I've reached my bandwidth, you know, it's, um, uh, yeah. you know, so, it, and you know what, I, I think actually the growth of, of, of our industry has helped me, uh, you know, it's encouraged me more, even more to stay in my lane, you know, and, you know, I do what I, what I do all the time. You know, I, like I, I kiddingly say all the time is my goal is to be like Kentucky fried chicken. You know, I do one thing right. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, I think that's, yeah, that's so insightful. And the it's, it's very consistent with the way that I'm currently running my consulting practices. I'm sure, you know, where I just only, uh, I only do motorcycle collisions now, uh, unless it's a photogrammetry project. Those are my two specialties. But should I be the guy that goes and downloads a 2022 Freightliner to tell you or image it, which is like you're saying the correct term? We'll, we'll get in trouble for saying the word download nowadays. But should I be the guy to go download that Freightliner? No, I will probably miss some small subtlety that somebody who's made an entire career of just downloading heavy trucks will pick up and it might be useful to the case. So like you said, I've learned, stay in my lane and it's a multidisciplinary effort at this point. And I've, uh, I've never really thought about it in the way that you just mentioned it, but it's, it's so true. Uh, with how sophisticated it is, who has the mental bandwidth to be good at all of that, everything that goes into a current reconstruction, uh, very yeah. few people. Well, and you know what? I, I've seen some police agencies uh, have multidisciplinary teams, like uh, have community uh, where like a group of four or five police agencies get together and form a crash reconstruction unit, and they'll have one person doing the mapping and another person doing the recon cal, you know, the math yep. and another person doing the human factors end of things. And I, I see that, that being an approach and that's effective for many different ways. Number one, it is also effective on the budgets, you know, that, uh, you know, police department a only has to fund maybe two or three guys, and yet they have a whole team that they can come out and, uh, 
And so I've, I've seen some very successful teams. Now, some state police agencies just have the bandwidth. Larger state police agencies like California Highway Patrol, Wisconsin State Police, you know, Michigan State Police, they have, they have numbers, right? Uh, and, uh, they, they can form their multidisciplinary teams, but, um, small, smaller police agencies, uh, I really like the idea, and, and I've seen some good work out of some of the agencies that they get together and one or two guys are specialized in each different area. And, you know, each department has two or three guys that are trained, and then they st- keep them focused on, you know, on what they do well. And, uh, and, and, you know, that, that's, uh, that's that's worked out very well for some some agencies, both financially and you know because it's not a burden on your budget and uh, and also the quality of the work. Yeah, and it's great in this industry. There's some things that I try to stay hands off on, like a heavy vehicle download, because it's so sophisticated and so specialized. But as a reconstructionist, I have to download a 2020 Camry which generally is not very difficult, but at times things can get a little tricky and I feel very fortunate to have colleagues that are willing to help out. Rick Ruth, Rusty Hay, Brad Muir, people who specialize in EDRs or anything where I can call them up and say, I think I can get trained up on this little uh, specialty within this discipline very quickly if I just reach out to somebody like that. Um, And that allows me to at least remain broad enough to do what I think is essential and then pass off everything else. I'm not touching biomechanics. I'm not touching heavy trucks. I'm not touching human factors, especially at nighttime. I'll do rider stuff because of all the work you and I have done together and published. But I, I'm with you. It's rare that I'm the only guy on the expert team. It's it, it's tough to do that nowadays. Yeah. And, and uh off topic a little bit. I don't know if you've seen the Kinapali study. I haven't. No. Oh, is that new motorcycle study? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and they looked into response time of several different events, real life, right? Dry riders, two wheelers out there and, uh, dummies being pulled out into their path. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, that sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah that's some research that uh, Jeff and I did. I, I'm wondering, I thought we did the research in 2009, um, and then it got published subsequently, that motorcycle behavior study. Yeah, it was published in 2011 and 2014. Okay. Right, 2011, yeah. 2014. And then, then we read, we met in Massachusetts in 2015, right? That's right. And then right. that got published in 2017, I think. Yeah, and that was, we won't go too deep into it since we're three hours in, but that was uh, analyzing the response of drivers and riders. So people who both drove vehicles and rode motorcycles, and we sent them around this course to see how they would respond to certain stimuli and if it was different, whether they were on a motorcycle or driving a car. And that was that's that was the beginning for us. And to clarify, when you say course, uh, of course, we told them to drive through a town, right? Open roads, right? Yep. And uh, and uh, well, you know what? That was very insightful. You know, in a lot of ways, and um, you know, particularly when we're starting to again, the data directs you to better research questions, right? For your next study. And, and so as we're, you know, we did the study out in Arizona and there wasn't a lot of traffic out there. And then we did it in Massachusetts and it was a fair amount, you know, normal traffic in the area. And we're starting to see different data. And then we started discussing, well, why would we get different data? Why, Why different results? And then we started testing Riding alone versus riding in a group, and I, right. you know, I, I think that really told us that our riders in Arizona were told to follow a lead vehicle, 
And so they were riding very much like a rider in a group, right? Trusting the lead driver to do some of the work, right? And yeah. then in Massachusetts, we were told them, no, here's the route. Go out on your own. Right. Well, that was always a little bit nerve wracking. You know, like equip their motorcycle with, you know, thirty thousand dollars of data acquisition system. They're under your watch and you're just like counting the seconds until they get back. Yeah. Yeah. But that was great. Great data. It was great. It was, you know, it, 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 there's still a lot of data there, you know. There is. And that's so one of the questions I don't think I've asked you yet, but is on my list. And this is a call for anybody who's watching this. First of all, there's like Jeff is saying, there's so much data in that data set. And I think we'd both be totally willing to share it for somebody who wants to pour over it. But one of the things that we don't even have in the literature now from my end is the average acceleration rate of motorcyclists. Like what is a typical acceleration profile of a motorcyclist? And that data is sitting right there, V-Box data with video. And I just haven't had time to look at it. Wade hasn't had time to look at it. Uh, you haven't had time to look at it. Well, I... I did look at the acceleration rate of the left turn across path, right? Of the riders. Uh, so the riders and drivers. So okay. if you re recall, they were on, I think, Amity Road turned on to Lincoln uh, mm. yep. when they were turning, where we had the Sasquatch cam. Oh, yes. I remember that. Yeah. So that, and that was a pretty, yeah, that was a pretty tough turn where they had to get across quickly if they wanted to reduce any injury changes. Acceleration or? was identical, cars and riders. Okay, that's interesting. And that's that that's consistent with my thought is it's a human it's a human element. Yeah. There uh, nobody is accelerating as quickly as they possibly can every time they take off on a motorcycle. Uh yeah, so that no well, I'm sorry, that was route 9 turning on to Lincoln, right? Okay. And then they drove up Lincoln and they got to Lincoln and Amity and that's where that big hedge was on the right-hand side. Yep. And there was a, a site obstruction. And so we're looking into particularly the glance behaviors there. And, the, and, and so, we, again, in the first couple seconds of acceleration, riders and drivers were identical. In the second second of acceleration, riders gained about two miles an hour on the drivers. Mm -hmm. In seconds three, four, and five, again, identical accelerations, hmm. right? And so, yes, riders did accelerate faster, but not in every phase of the acceleration. So think of it this way. When you're starting out, I don't care if you're in a rickshaw or a motorcycle or a bicycle or a car, you still have to make sure it's clear to go, right? And so yeah. you still have that, you know, edging out and time to accelerate you know, that first couple se se second or so. And then, you know, that's where you have the maximum acceleration and that's where riders beat drivers. But then after that, you're reaching your desired speed, right? So it's a behavior again, right? So, yeah. w you know, w where, where you have driving behaviors, we don't see much of a difference at all. Where we see acceleration behaviors, that's where you're going to, you know, likely see uh, riders go a little faster. And, and, you know, I, so I was, I, I think I looked, you know, that for, we had that first intersection, they came from our meeting location, yeah. the parking lot yep. where we were, and they went down a hill and they got to a traffic signal and then they turned left at that signal. I looked at the yep. acceleration there. Uh, and then I looked at the acceleration uh, at Lincoln and Amity with the obstruction. And then I looked at the turn in. And uh, that that's all I saw. That, that's the only time I saw riders were different than drivers. And, uh, but, but. So was that published? No. No. Oh, okay. So we got to, so the data exists. It just needs to be written up. I mean, the data has been analyzed. It just needs to be written up. Well, it, basically, uh, you got me thinking one time. We had a conversation, and um, and I decided to look at a couple of the intersections and to see, you know, is there? Uh, we were we were concerned about the data and the um, 
if we could calculate in, did we have the data to do it? And we certainly have the data to do it. Right. And, uh, uh, and I was wondering if there was a significant difference. Uh, and it does appear that there will be, uh, when you have, you know, other than the left turn across path, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I, I look for, I, I'd love to, to, so let me know. I got plenty of free time as you do, I'm sure. So yeah. let's, uh, let's get well, together so, on that. So one. yeah, basically what I was doing is I was looking at a pilot, you know, just seeing yeah. if it's feasible. See if it was worth. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I expected that we were going to get back in touch and, you know, and you and Wade were talking about doing it. And so I, I, I'm telling you now the feasibility. Yes, it's feasible. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We got to get that together. And. On that front, are there any other gaps in the literature that you currently see that should be addressed, that other researchers' uh, help could be uh, valuable on? Oh, goodness gracious. Almost every class I teach, somebody brings up something. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it, it'd be uh, – I don't, I don't – I can't think of any – uh, instance right now, but you know, sit through one of my classes and I guarantee you somebody's going to go, Hey, Jeff, you know, uh, what's the average response time for, you know, this crazy situation here? And, and, uh, you know, sometimes I just have to say, well, there isn't any research on that, you know, and, uh, but fortunately we're seeing that's fewer all the time. Because there's been some uh, really beautiful research that, like I said, it just all sings the same tune. And, uh, and so when I see current researchers trying to model driver response times and lumping all different events together as if they're one or speculating that well, you know, response time is based upon, uh, you know, from when the driver could recognize to when something else can happen. And if it's a surprise situation or non-surprise. And, and so in that sentence is like four subjective words that you can't quantify, right? And so I'm like, all right, great. Somebody with hindsight bias is going to go look at some video and, and they're going to categorize what a response time is from an, uh, some arbitrary starting point to some arbitrary ending point and, and put very different events together and, 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 com and use that as a comparison. And I, uh, it frustrates me that, uh, there's, there's data out there for every, I would say just about every crash type, right? And, um, and, we can see how drivers have responded in just, I would say, more than, certainly more than 90, probably 95% of all crash types, somebody's done a response time study on it, right? And, uh, and so there's data out there. The question yeah. is, are you, are you too lazy to get it? And, yeah. uh, you know, and are that, you analyzing it properly? Or, yeah, that lump sum thing sounds like a problem. And then, like you mentioned before, uh, the ambiguity with when to start the clock. I mean, that's so important. That's one of the biggest things that I'm always looking at when I am utilizing, utilizing your models or your research is, OK, in this collision type, where are the researchers starting the clock? You know, if it's a left turn across path, it's the initiation of the leftward movement. If you're coming into a roadway, is it is it when the car passes the stop line or is it when the car enters the intersection? And where you start that changes everything. So it's it's really important. And I've seen in some of the research people uh, mess around with that so that it becomes very difficult to compare to other research. And that's exactly it, is they're messing around and not offering an expert opinion. So an expert opinion is not no one like when somebody takes my class and somebody asks me to be an expert, I, I, I take it very seriously and I take it as no one wants to know what Jeff Mutart thinks. They want yeah. to know what Jeff Mutart knows. 
And this, so I, I view that a big difference, right? So what I know is what the research says drivers did in that situation. What I think I know could be biased, right? Mm. And so who cares what I think? It's how drivers have responded. It's what I know that's important. And, yeah. you know, so I hear quite often experts, you know, say, well, you know, some experts can be biased. And, you know, I say, well, you know, that expert could be you. If, if you're in this profession and you are giving your personal opinion, then that expert's you. And, uh, it's like, I don't want to, I don't want to hear your opinion. I want to see your data. Right. Is kind of the way that I feel about that. It's like, right. hopefully by the end, when I'm done, nothing here is my opinion. It's all just the data applied to this crash. Well, and, and, and so I, I'm sure you've heard me say before, you know, where I kiddingly say, blame somebody else for everything. And what I mean by that is cite, you know, the unbiased research, not, personal opinion. So don't tell me that you think the response time is blank. Don't tell me that you think response time changes due to age. Don't tell me that you think response time would change because this is a lot different than what the research would be. If you don't know the research, how do you know it's different than what the research would be? Uh, Somebody uh, said to me is uh, when I was uh, discussing the problem uh, sometimes experts are e- are very willing to accept the low hanging fruit of a of like a one point five second response time, like an arbitrary number. Except when it's somebody in their family involved, mm-hmm. then they want the right answer. They want everything right, like. And so I, that's happened a couple times where I know experts. Uh, have used just arbitrary numbers, and then all of a sudden it's a case that they're really interested in. All of a sudden they want the research, right? Mm. So my my advice to all of us, including myself, is to treat every c- crash like you want to get it right, and it's really important to get it right because it's somebody's family, you know? And uh, And if we handle it that way, that we're going to give – what we know, not what we think, right? Mm. Uh, I, I think that will go a long way to uh, to improving, like, uh, the, the improve the situation. Like the saying is, uh, data uh, data gives everybody justice, you know? Mm. And that, you know, somebody once asked me, do you try to be fair in your analysis? And it's like, <laughs> fair is way too stressful for me, right? Like, I I don't know what fair is, right? It, it, is it fair that these people got in a crash? You know, it's not fair, right? I, I, I can't deal with fair. All I can deal with is, uh, is, is it right? Did I follow the right procedure? And, and am I given good data? And, uh, and that's all we can do. You know, we just got to be a, a cog in the system, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, lo- I love it. I mean, follow the scientific method and apply the data that is available and admit where there are holes, like you're saying in the classes, where there's holes in the data or the current literature and you just can't answer that part uh, of, of the question. So a little bit more of an easy question here. Is there a tool that's in your kit right now that you don't think will be there anymore in like five to 10 years, something you're using now that the industry is going to evolve away. Well, you know what? Some, you know, I, I can imagine uh, some crash reconstruction programs might become uh, outdated, you know, is, is uh, as we get more information and more data, if the downloads become more, you know, downloads images become more sophisticated uh yeah then i can maybe some become outdated or some have to uh move a little bit better as supplemental uh programs right rather than uh 
replacement programs for cr- crash reconstruction. So, you know, I, I think of the years that, you know, I, I do a smack analysis. Right? Yeah. And, you know, you find yourself at four in the morning. You started at six evening, six in the evening, and it's now four in the morning and you're now running your, you know, 48th iteration to try to like, uh, I, I, I changed the friction between the two metals <laughs> and now yep. I changed the tire friction and now I changed this and, and you're trying to get the vehicle to land on the final resting position. <laughs> yes. And oh my just, gosh. Uh, you know, and I, 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 I think, uh, you know, that kind of analysis, it sort of has become outdated. And um, uh, especially now we know the answers uh, and we have to prove that the answer was given to us in a proper way. Right. And so yeah, from like EDR data and then right. confirming that yeah. via either momentum calcs or a simulation. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's a, it's a good point because I, I know PC Crash has built this uh, op- optimizer so that you can give it certain parameters for each val- uh, variable and just say they have to stick within this. They hit like this and they go over there. Tell me what their speeds were. Um, and as AI is, of course, becoming more and more commonplace and more advanced, I wonder if there's an integration between the simulation platforms and AI where we can leave at 7 p.m. instead of 4 a.m. and just have AI kind of help guide us anyway and use our judgment and its power to create a simulation that is much more efficient. That goes back to uh, the field becoming more sophisticated and, 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 and moving with the evidence that we have, you know. And, uh, but, you know, there's a lot of, well, you know, the PC crash and then the HVA and it just, I, I look at how each one of those have evolved from the first iteration of those programs. Uh, it's just, you know, they're, they're nothing like they, they, they're nothing like now, they're nothing now like what they were when they started, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, they're, they've, Really advanced, yeah, and, and and now with point clouds and mesh in photogrammetry and meshes and building all sorts of photorealistic environments within the simulation platforms. Uh, at times, it's it's amazing. Um, so kind of wrapping things up, we went. I, I knew that you and I would talk forever because this is just like a normal dinner for us, except we, we we were forced to stay on track a little bit more than we might if we we're out um, having a beer, but. Um, just to kind of wrap things up a little bit, uh, I'd like to talk about what you're excited about for the future. And I know you just changed the name of your company and you're doing a rebranding and there's a lot of, you have a lot of changes going on over there that sounds super exciting. So, uh, I'd love to hear a bit about where you're heading and what's blowing your hair back. (laughs) What we are excited about in the future is because We now have data for most crash types. We can look into more specifically what drivers need for good road design. What do drivers need uh, to respond well? How do we improve the 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 decrease the uncertainty of drivers? Because we know, think of it this way. If I ask you to slap the table every time my finger goes up, And if my finger goes up exactly once every second, so you know at one, two, three, four, five, six seconds, right? And if you know every second on the second, my finger is going to go up, you can get your response time down to zero because at 100% probability, you can learn how to match my time, right? And you response time is zero with 100% probability. But imagine now you're a driver and the average driver faces a near crash once every 10 years, right? Now what's your probability? And are you likely going to, go, now, now you're seeing the finger and you go, 
what was that finger for again? <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's exactly yeah. what happened uh, in the Johansson and Rumor study, the study that Ashto is relying upon for the road standard. They had drivers. They, they, th- this is the unalerted drivers, right? They asked drivers, Hey, would you mind being a part of an unalerted driver study? But they're still unalerted, right? They know they're in a study, right? We're going to put a buzzer in your vehicle, right? But they're unalerted. We want you to brake when you hear the buzzer, but they're unalerted. The buzzer goes off. They don't brake. Oh, let's come back. Let's throw out those first three times that you guys didn't do well. Let's practice, right? Hmm. So they know the stimulus. They know the response. They know it's a buzzer. They drive down the road. It's just a question of when the buzzer goes off, right? And then they respond to the buzzer after practicing, right? And they then determine, well, when when they you know when they responded to the buzzer and they didn't know when it was going to be, they responded thirty five percent slower. And so they said, well, thirty five percent plus you know times two seconds. That's 2.7 seconds. Let's make it 2.5 second standard, right? And that's what your standard is based upon. They're basing it upon drivers responding to a buzzer that they knew was coming. They knew what to do about it and they got the practice. And that's what our road, road design standard is based upon, right? That's the only study that's cited right now in the current Ashto standard. Wow. So, you know, that's not a really good comforting feeling that our entire road system is designed on a study of drivers who knew everything that was coming right yeah. and uh and so what we want to do going forward is to encourage auto manufacturers to at least look at the data we have right uh don't speculate don't write a paper uh, suggesting that, you know, well, when the driver perceives, you don't know when a driver perceives, right? You're, you can download the E, you can download the CDR. You can download the ECM, right? You can download an EDR. You can't download the EEG, right? We don't have <laughs> yeah. that feature, right? So, yeah. Uh, so we, you know, it, we, we don't know when the driver, uh, we don't know when the driver r- responded, right? Well, we, we don't know when the driver's neurons fired, right? Uh, so wouldn't it be better if we had some baseline, some scientific baseline, like the, like is required of, of forensic scientists to use a classical scientific approach of comparing what your driver did to what other drivers have done. So that's, that's what we've, that's what we strive to do. We strive to be that data source for crash investigators and for safety people. We don't consider ourselves safety people. We consider ourselves data people, right? And we, our job is to help safety people. So we collect information. I think, you know, our goal is to collect every driver response study that's been conducted and, and, and distill that and, uh, create a software program called response where they can put in the, the, the crash type they're interested in. And we give them the results of the studies for that crash type, how drivers have responded, how drivers have have reacted, how drivers have accelerated, you know, depending on what their question is. Right. And uh, so uh, we just came out with our uh, our book for crash investigators. I have. Yeah, I got the old one. Right. I think this is the third edition. So uh, this is the and fourth. This, I was going to say, this is really helpful because, oh, okay, there's the new one. So I'm going to have to get, I think this one's autographed by you. So I would prefer um, if you could send me an autographed version. But this is really handy for me. Um, and I imagine a lot of people who don't have your background, but this version, I can very quickly find the literature that helps me to understand how I would expect the driver to respond in a certain situation and where the clock should be started. 
Well, I even tried to do a little better job in this book of, of taking you through the steps of a classical scientific approach. Uh, we also have a word search at the back of the book and, uh, a lot more data. So, uh, for every crash type, I, I give the studies. I give the common response time for that crash type, uh, and the studies it's based upon and what each study said. And, uh, and so it's, we, you know, we try to make sure, you know, I view myself as, as um, sort of like a, a Cyrano de Bergerac or something like this, I, I, you know, I, I'm not good enough looking to get the princess, but I can help you get the princess. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, you know. So when you're testifying, uh, I. You know, that's my goal is to be in your ear and to give you advice uh, and and help of what research has been done and what has that research said. So you can tell the court what you know and not what you think. Right. And uh, and and so that's my goal is like data. Like, yeah, I, I've said it before. Data does everybody justice. And if we the more science that gets in the courtroom, the more science that gets uh, you know, for automated drivers, o- automated driving companies that are claiming that their vehicle is better than what a human does, but they don't know what a human does, right? Yeah. Uh, we do know what a human does, right? And, uh, and, and so if you really want to know what a human does, you know, uh, take a look at the data in the book, take a look at the data in the, in the software, and uh, you can see what, what humans do. And so where do, where do people go to find you in that data? Uh, well, we're, we're the Driver Research Institute. Uh, if you go to, you know, driverresearchinstitute.com, uh, and, uh, and, you know, or, or their number is, uh, 860-861-1418. Um, and, uh, or email at info at driverresearchinstitute.com. And, uh, and, you know, there's, uh, we, we've helped quite a few crash investigators and safety professionals and, and, uh, automobile manufacturers. Uh, we've, we get calls from quite different locations and, uh, we're, we're more than willing to help, uh, people if they want to know what drivers have done uh, in diff- in different situations. As evidenced by your willingness to donate three and a half hours of your time <laughs> to talk to us when I, when I know you're, you're extremely busy. So uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. It's been a, a fantastic conversation. I learned a lot uh, and I'm, I'm going to have to listen back to this and take some notes and grab some things to apply to my own recons. That's for sure. Well, you know what? It's been fun, Lou. And, and like I say, I, I, I'm, I'm very proud of the, uh, of the way you've developed and, uh, you are, uh, you are very special in this field and, and, uh, and it's, it's pretty cool to just kick back. And you know what I was saying, like, why do I feel so comfortable with some people and, and, uh, you know what? You always feel comfortable with the kids you grew up with, you like your neighborhood kids. But the other, the other thing is you always feel comfortable with the people you did research with. <laughs> you know, mm, yeah. when, when you've spent day and night working together and then crunching numbers together, it does it, on an ironing board as a, <laughs> as, as a desk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and like you know, in hotel rooms and ironing boards and and uh, and a, a lot of uh, bad food and uh, and you know, uh, late nights in hotel rooms and stuff and and uh, it does. It, you know what? It it's you get what you put in, and when you put in a lot of work, you you tend to develop bonds with the people you put in a lot of work with. You know and. Uh, so, uh, I, I, I do 
I do look back fondly uh, as to the studies we've done together. I thought we did good work, and I think I think we learned a lot. You know, absolutely, yeah. And I, I the 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 uh, respect and pride is mutual. Not that I had anything to do with the development of your career, but you absolutely did uh, have something to do with the development of my career. Um, I was thinking back to it when I took your class, I must've been like 26 or seven when I said, Hey, do you want to do some research together? And who the heck says yes to a 26 or 27 year old to do some big research together? So I appreciate that. If you recall, my first answer was hell no. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. I, I blocked that part out. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, Oh my God, I'm so busy right now. It's like, I don't know. And motorcycle study. And, and then, you know, you impressed me because you went, no, look at I can develop this automated system that triggers an a, you know an emergency response for drivers and and uh, and I went oh that's pretty that's cool. right you know? I remember that that was before I had kids when I had the time to actually build something like that uh, uh, and that that turned out really good I remember showing up to the research and you had a backup uh, methodology because you're like well just in case yours doesn't work because. <laughs> It was, it was pretty, it was like remote wireless. And for back then it was pretty darn tricky. I thought so. And, and, uh, uh, and by the way, like I told you right from the beginning, right. And was I right or was I wrong? But you lose data in studies, right. And yeah. you're going to, you, you want to do everything you can not to lose data because subjects are valuable and, and so you usually have backup, you know, all right, this is my number one way. Like the last study we had, we had those armbands that you had. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, so we zero data lost on that study, which uh, is one of my proudest yeah, professional accomplishments. Yeah. Zero data loss, you know, in that that's last study it, for a live study. That's yeah. spectacular. All you hail know? data. For a yeah. data junkie, you need to maintain yeah. it all. Yeah. Um, well, until next time, hopefully we'll have a chance to do this again. I really appreciate you taking the time, and uh, uh, I'm sure I'll talk to you shortly. All right. All right. Thanks, okay. Jeff. Thanks, Lou. Hey, everyone. One more thing before you get back to business, and that is my weekly bite-sized email to the point. Would you like to get an email from me every Friday discussing a single tool, paper, method, or update in the community? Past topics have covered Toyota's vehicle control history, including a coverage chart, ADAS, that's Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, Tesla vehicle data reports, free video analysis tools, and handheld scanners. If that sounds enjoyable and useful, head to lightpointdata.com slash to the point to get the very next one.